working group within the working group within the um, ACT IAC organization as the industry co-chair along with Don Lovett, Sam Navarro and Mike Burkholz and I are super honored uh, to do this three hour session where we feel our participants and our attendees and our panelists will walk away with uh, uh, many a light bulb moment on the uh, internet of things in case you're wondering uh, for anybody out there what that means, IOT. Uh, is looking like down the road here and in the near term in the United States government and across uh, the, the, the public private uh, sectors. We're planning to have a day where you're going to hear stories, you're going to hear from the wonderful Renee Wynn, we're going to close it out with Jim St. Pierre at the NIST, and you will hear throughout from some other folks at the NIST, uh, Drs. Barbara Cuthill and Dr. Michael Dunaway, where smart cities and the Internet of Things are really becoming a cool topic, but also with a cybersecurity of physical systems element. So this is as much about innovation and excitement as well as risk mitigation. So lots to learn. And then we have a panel baked in there where I'll uh, be leading a conversation among uh, Greg Bell and, and uh, Michael and Barbara and, and Andy Bachman from the National Labs and Ray Falcone from Heavy AI. And you'll get a perspective on on this partnership role that it takes a village to implement IoT and, and you'll hear some great use cases. And then we're really excited to, to have representation from AirViz, Ian Magazine, President and CEO, Managing Partner at Verizon, Brian Shromsky, who is a wonderful view of 5G and its impact on smart city development and other uh, topics. And then Jerry Kurtz from the West Coast at JFrog, which is uh, on the surface DevSecOps kind of uh, mission, but also how it's tying into the IoT. So we really hope you could tune in, stay in, stay engaged. But uh, with that, uh, let me just ask Sam Navarro, Sam Navarro, why don't you uh, take, a, take a few moments and introduce our, our dear friend, Renee. Sure, sure thing. And great way to kick us off, Pete. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules to spend time with us on a very important topic, which is the Internet of Things. So um, I want to take an opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker for today. And Ms. Renee Wynn is not only a TEDx speaker, but she's also the former chief information officer for two agencies that you may have heard about, the EPA and NASA. Um, one of the interesting efforts that she led while being the CIO of NASA was to establish what's known today as the Federal Mobility Group which has built 5G security profiles, has enhanced the ability and capability of agencies to understand um, the cybersecurity aspects of 5G, and also has been working and contributing to IoT use cases, which is our subject for today. So it's my privilege, my honor to introduce one of my mentors and just a great American, Ms. Renee Wynn, as our keynote speaker for today. So Renee, the floor is all yours. Good morning, Sam, and thank you for those lovely remarks. It's good to see everybody, and I do want to also add my thanks for folks that have taken time out of their busy days and rolled into today's session. You have some amazing speakers. Uh, some of them are institutions which NASA, when I was at NASA, we relied on quite heavily in terms of overhauling our cybersecurity posture, and I, I will remind you that NASA had a has a cybersecurity off the globe as well. And we certainly have it, uh, a lot of uses of, of internet of things in order to make a really cool mission come true. So I'm just gonna open with kind of setting the stage for how you can hear the speakers and how you can make some, uh, have takeaways and uh, continue the discussions within your community, whether you're on the side of the United States government or if you're on the public sector, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for some collaboration as well. So the benefits of Internet of Things are so obvious, right? It's the connectivity. So uh, my father, who had a little bit of a heart issue, he got a heart monitor and he had a little data box that he carried around with him. And so for in his ordinary living, he was they were able to monitor his heart in, in that, not just when you go into the office where you may be able to maybe be a little more stressed or a little less stressed, but give you real live reads on how your heart is doing through the course of a day. Um, I couldn't break into it to get the data. I wasn't trying to break the device, but I wanted to see the information as a as a one uh, as a daughter who was trying to also participate in the medical 
his medical conditions to make sure he was getting the best care possible, um, which is you know awesome. I myself have an Alexa. I can start a timer across the room. I wear an Apple Watch and it gives me all sorts of data, data that might give me a little bit of a frowny face and that. Um, and then you've got toys. This particular toy, which is Mars, is not an Internet of Things, but there are many toys that are out there that are Internet of Things, which do some pretty spectacular thing and can teach children a lot of really cool things. I think that they also need to include a, a segment on the new toys about privacy and security. But, you know, when I get to be in charge of a toy maker, I'll be able to influence it. But if you have an uh, opportunity to influence toy makers, go for it. Then there's the really cool thing, which is the mobile launch system. So if any of you watched the launch of Artemis, the SLS, the Space Launch System, uh, one of the largest rockets in the United States that has uh, successfully launched on November 16th, what you saw on the mobile launch unit, which was also visible at times during the coverage of this, has 400,000 sensors on it with all sorts of responsibilities associated with those particular sensors. Despite the regular activity of leaving this planet on a rocket for payload or the launch of satellites or the most common activities into space here in the United States, um, it's still a very risky business to put that much firepower into a, a rocket and take off from this planet to, to actually make some great things happen in space. And that, so you get a lot of valuable data. And when I say a lot, you get a lot of valuable data. And so the, a lot of the opportunities, which I'll talk about in that, is how do you um, sift through that data and turn that data into really valuable information, knowledge, and in some cases, action, right? When a sensor gives you an anomalous behavior, then you know to go check it to make sure that it is working as it should and see what it is detecting to investigate it, which are the lessons we learned with Notre Dame. And that is the center was going off, that there was a smoke and it wasn't paid attention to as much as it needed to. And, and that um, historic uh, cathedral it took in a lot of damage. It was a very sad day. So your sensors can give you false data, but you probably should still go check on it when it happens. And then something maybe a little bit more mundane, but kind of important if you travel or you're in a place and that are trash cans that are internet of things. And that is one is when they get too full, they compact the trash, but they also alert the city that, well, this trash can's a little full, which, you know, then they can come back around and uh, pick up the trash on the full trash cans to prevent rats. New York City's having that problem in spades right now, but also ensure like a good experience and keep that trash uh, from becoming litter and ending up in our waterways um, and uh, creating problems uh, for clean water in, in our lives. So there's lots of different ways to think of internet of things and there's really cool benefits associated with it. So right now I want you to put on your little imagination brains here first thing in the morning. If you drink caffeine, hopefully it's kicked in here right now. But we're going to create our own Internet of Things, and I'm going to lead you through it since it's hard to have an amazing dialogue with all the folks that I see, the names that I see here across my screen. And that is an ordinary rake. Well, perhaps you have one in the back of your garage. I do. And, I'm th and so I'm going to go out and garden, and I'm going to need some information about my garden. And I used to not have information about my garden. I would just sort of wing it and hope my plants survive. Anybody that knows me knows that if I'm talking about gardening, my plants don't survive. I, I have to pick very hardy ones that can serve, you know, survival of the fittest. But let's imagine that I've got that green thumb here. And that rake, well, what do I need to know? Well, I probably need to know the moisture of the soil that I'm using. So I rake across it in a little Reader there, I'll call it an LED reader, tells me mm, your moisture is this. Great. So now I know a little bit about the moisture. So a particular plant, let's say a cactus, probably doesn't want to go here because I'm getting a lot of moisture. All right. So then I pick the plants based on my data coverage when I just rake to clean it up a little bit, make it look a little bit neater. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm very sun sensitive. So my rake should tell me when I've maybe taken in too much sunshine and I'm at risk of burn. I'm already going to have my sunscreen on, but I've, if I've got super sensitive skin, a nice little alert going, you're at your maximum and you don't want to burn because that's very dangerous. Another sunlight thing is it tells me 
a little bit about the sunlight that's hitting that particular garden. So is it shady, which I should be able to see, sunny or different? So now I'm pulling together my sunshine data and my moisture data, and I'm learning more and more about my garden just by simply raking the garden. Well, let's say I really like to have nice straight lines. Well, you know, what, why don't we put a site system on this that allows me to ensure that the rows of what I'm planting are nice and straight lines. So a simple rake that turns into an IoT can help you garden. So even our simple things can make life a little bit easier or maybe greater success in the garden, which I'm always looking for that um, to, to make happen. So simple things can go internet of things and make uh, and bring tremendous benefits to our lives. So that's your little fun drill for the morning. Hopefully you got things, the little gray cells for anybody that watched Poro, uh, get going here first thing in the morning and so that you're really well prepared to listen to the speakers. Well, then I'm gonna shift in to the dark side. Having worked in information technology for a number of years, there's this light side and there's a dark side that's associated with this one. So the dark side about privacy. I am fully aware about the data that my watch is being picked up. I've got some of those controls turned off, uh, but who's getting that data and where are they turning that data into? You know, who else is getting the data just besides Apple, which is the watch that I wear? Well, for women in particular, given the recent Supreme Court case, you need to be thinking about where your data are going and the rhythms of your body. Men, maybe not so much, but I know for women, uh, we are beginning to see the use of the data from those watches um, in a way that's very concerning um, because it is a complete violation of privacy when you are monitoring a female um, in particular, especially if she's not giving you permission uh, to do that monitoring. And then there's security. A lot of the Internet of Things devices, especially the earlier ones, don't have a way to put security software on them, and they come out of the box with no capability to do that. So the conversations in my house, which was nothing particularly serious to go on in it, yes, they are being recorded by Alexa because every once in a while we ask her what's on our grocery list, and I can tell you we don't hear milk, eggs, and cheese. We usually hear bits and pieces of things that we have said and all it does is make us laugh and then makes us feel a little bit better about AI and, and where it needs to go in terms of listening. Um, but we are helping to train it. So we do have to think about that as well. Um, and so I want to tell you about a story about a software, an Internet of Things that actually um, alerted us to a very significant issue with uh, the deep space network. So what I'm talking about is, is available in the public, just a quick Google search. There's only a few articles on that one associated with it, but a sign was put up to help uh, assign a post to help uh, at one of the facilities of NASA to help track kind of where some of the really cool things were. James Webb Space Telescope, although it wasn't launched at the time, Hubble was, International Space Station, perhaps a particular satellite, a polar probe, a solar probe or something like that. And the sign would help you know what was overhead where you were. When that sign was put onto the network, it should have gone on to its own separate network. Lesson number one, uh, it was not. It was put on uh, a regular working network. And in the end, very grateful for that human error because it alerted us what was happening as we found the devices were be, it was monitored, which is the good thing. It was on the wrong network, but what we found was anomalous behaviors and what was happening where data were being moved into the, the signpost itself in order to allow for a pickup by a nefarious actor. And so that happy mistake, although it didn't look that way at first, that happy mistake told us that there was something wrong within the deep space network. And so we quickly closed off. Well, we actually monitored a little bit longer uh, for criminal activity. Then we cut that thing off and then we got to work taking a look at 1800 servers twice with assistance of our colleagues around other federal agencies. And that uh, initiated a complete overhaul of the architecture of the deep space network, which is probably still going on today because it was pretty extensive. But it was also a good reminder, every 
large enterprise, any medium enterprise, and even a small enterprise should have multiple networks, have your internet of things on a separate network, your operational technology for your HVACs or cooling systems, NASA has a ton of cooling systems, right? Uh, have them on their own separate network and then have your information technology on another network. And you may need more than the three that I've talked about. And also make sure they're monitored. Uh, and so that when anomalous behaviors happen, you know about it, but you also understand what is an anomalous behavior. Sensors do a lot of things. They're going to be very active communicating in things. Well, that activity is a good thing, but you don't want too many false alerts to people because we get numb to them and we say, eh, no, thanks. And we don't go investigate when we should. And then there are opportunities. As we talk about this, you've got the risk and you've got the reward associated, which really kind of comes out to being opportunities. One, the cybersecurity people never run out of work to do, which I think is fabulous. Uh, 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 INL, uh, the Idaho National Lab, uh, which has actually had in my lifetime of working four separate names. So I hope I got it right on this one. Uh, the work that they're doing to investigate and help agencies really take control over the Internet of Things to bring the benefit and manage the risk associated with it. So thank you for your great work there. That's was a big user of them. So more data, more insights. Ooh, gosh, what do I do? My brain overloads and I have more than probably 10 things to do in a day. So you have this opportunity within data sciences and turning information to really valuable insights. And you can turn data on its head to see things in a different way because it's so much easier to work with the data and, um, and analyze the data and visualize the data, which is also very cool to do that. Then you have the sense of humor, right? The sense of humor part is when our yard Alexa tells us what's on his grocery list, which was a snippet of a yelling at the TV during a maybe a football game or two that I watched or World Cup soccer, and you start laughing at yourself on that one. You can also begin to handle more complex risk models with your data associated with it, which is really good because anytime you bring in IT, OT, and Opera in IoT, you increase the complexity of your enterprise as well as the risks associated with it. And finally, the big opportunity in this is the vendor collaboration and the contractor collaboration with the United States government. Bring cool IoT into the environment to serve the mission and make sure that you keep your eyes on the security on that one. And we see some really good work on Mars with the AI and the internet of things that are up there on some of the rovers, making those combinations and making new discoveries and bringing that cool data back down to earth for the benefit of humanity. So I will stop there and turn it over to your amazing leadership team here that has uh, pulled together a, a wonderful set of panels to help both educate and hopefully inspire you to go off and do great things for the United States government mission. Awesome. Uh, Renee, uh, storyteller that you are, I took some notes. And before we transition into our next panel, I just want to summarize some things that really resonated with me. And I love the word inspire. I like the educate, inform, and enlighten. Uh, triage of words, and I love Inspire. I might add that and make it a, a, a square kind of thinking geometrically here, but thank you and shout out to you. you. You talked about critical infrastructure, the water sector. You talked, I love the rake, bring it at home, right? Sensor on a rake, you know, you're out there gardening, but really you're, I love the, hey, I'm uh, learning a lot about the moisture that was uh, in the, in my case, a community that probably used a lot of clay, but I'm wondering why is my stuff not growing? Now I may know, maybe I need to get one of those rakes. I'm not going to get sunburned, but you're collecting data, right? We have the volume, velocity, variety, and veracity of data. Uh, so yes, sensors can collect, and then we have to know what to do with that data to turn information. The dark side, which, you know, privacy and security, both cyber and physical, we'll get into some of that in the next panel, but elevating that, that's a different uh, dialogue, folks, as Renee pointed out, privacy information, but then securing systems and networks, different. It takes a village. This is not something you buy on a shelf, plug it in and hope it works. And thank you for elevating OTIT integration, enterprise architecture 101, and that we have to do analysis and leverage AI and ML uh, to serve the mission. But I say to everyone selling in, know the mission. NASA's mission is different than energy's mission is different than the Labor Department's mission. If you're talking government, and then state locals, a whole other element. So Renee, if you want to stick around, uh, your, re your remarks have kick-started. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Sending you a big hug.
Great. Thank you so much. And everybody make it a great one and have a wonderful holiday season. Rock on, Mama. You're, you're the best. Okay. Uh, hey, I get to stick around now and pivot into uh, the next hour or so and looking at my, my clock here, my watch, which obviously is collecting data, at 927. We have an amazing and esteemed panel, Fireside Chat, that I will lead. And I'm going to introduce the names and titles and then what I love to do when I showcase thought leadership or we do is let these folks tell a little bit about themselves, their personal professional journey and how they have uh, impacted where they are today because they're loaded with wisdom. And collectively, we've got over hundreds of years, probably not that I'm dating anybody. Uh, and then what we're going to do is get right into uh, examples of how, whether it's the solution provider with heavy AI and core light, to what NIST is doing. And then of course, hearing from the wonderful Andy Bachman representing the National Laboratory, how this government industry and academia must be working together to benefit as Renee said, humanity. So with that, and again, the hashtag is up there, please use it, take pictures and send out. We're having a great dialogue. Uh, we have Greg Bell, co-founder and chief strategy officer at CoreLight, brother from another mother, deep roots in the National Laboratory ecosystem, West Coaster, developed a lot of software and you see his uh, title there, but I could tell you uh, storyteller aside, um, academic aside, he really understands where we're going as we like to say the puck's going, but also grounded in where we are today. So Greg, it's great to see you. Thank you, Pete. Uh, it's good to see you too. Awesome, brother. Uh, we have Ray Falcione. Ray, if I'm saying it wrong, please, that's my bad. Am I saying your name properly? Ray Falcione. Vice President GM for Heavy.ai. Yes, Fal Falcion. Falcion, okay, it's an Italian thing or something, <laughs> right? And I'm a Greek and That's I'm right. screwing it up. Okay, we got Ray here, VP and GM. I've known Ray for a while. Great company, analytics, situational awareness, visualization, making sense of data. If you don't know who Heavy.ai, Heavy.ai is, check it out. Ray is, uh, again, the VP, but he's been supporting federal, state, local for 30 years. He's a teacher, a true teacher, teaches engineering and classes on some of the most geeked out stuff, but it's all the underpinning of our, our most critical sector. And we're just super excited to have you here, Ray. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for having me. You got it. We've got Dr. Michael Dunaway, one of our two guests from NIST, Associate Director for Innovation, but I think he has a lot of titles. I get to work with Michael and deep respect for him as Program Lead for the Global Community Technology Challenge. If you don't know what that is, it's a great acronym, GCTC. It's a federal smart city program within the United States Department of Commerce. Uh, Michael's worked with the Red Cross, the Science and Technology Directorate at the Homeland Security. Again, I've known Michael. He is leading a group that I'm blessed to be a part of, which is globally looking at how smart cities are built, uh, the anatomy of smart cities, and obviously IoT is a big part of that. Uh, and he is also a veteran of the U.S. Navy. Thank you for your service, Michael. Thanks, Pete. Glad to be here and glad to join everyone this morning. You are the man, buddy. We've got uh, Ms. Barbara Cuthill, Dr. Cuthill, I Dr. believe. Dr. Cuthill, I believe. And Barbara, can you hear us? Yes. Awesome. So good to hear your voice. <laughs> there she is. Great yes. to see you, lady. I was so fired up when I heard you're going to be joining the panel. Um, I, I will tell everybody, Barbara has got an incredible title, Deputy Program Manager for the NIST Cybersecurity for IoT Program. Say that five times. Uh, but you'll hear from <laughs> you'll hear some uh, between Michael and Barbara for all of our government folk and all of our industry colleagues. There is a treasure trove of information on where the federal government and industry are working, are going together and collaboratively working on. And I have some resources I'll highlight. But Barbara is at the center of that IoT, the Internet of Things, and what it means from a mitigating risk, but also opportunity to innovate. Uh, we're super excited to have. Uh, Barbara here, and and again, another PhD, so way smart, super smart, you'll learn a ton. Thank you, Barbara, for joining us. Thank you. You got it. And last but not least, my other brother from another mother, the wonderful Andy Bachman from the Idaho National Laboratory and anywhere else you see him. Uh, he is an ambassador for innovation. I like to embarrass him from time to time. Uh, I've known Andy uh, as a senior grid strategist. Work I've done with the 
the NERC, which is also known as the, or it is known as the North American Electric, Electric Reliability Corporation. Uh, he's well-connected everywhere and anywhere, and he has a passion for technology and, of course, its impact on society, uh, equity. And he is right now, I know, very bullish on IoT for cyber physical systems, for critical infrastructure. He and I are working on some activities around data center and sustainability. So without further ado, please meet the wonderful Andy Bachman. Okay, yes, and I am embarrassed. And thank you, uh, Peter, and great to join the panelists and anybody attending this thing today. Appreciate it. Try to make it good for you. Oh, you already have, and everyone has. So in the spirit of we have about an hour, uh, 40, 50 minutes, and folks for the audience, please the, use the chat, write in questions, direct it to the person. They're going to be monitoring. We don't have scripted questions, uh, but we will move through this, and we're really hoping to make it fireside chat-like. So with that, Greg, I'm going to come back to you and give you that floor, take two to three, four minutes, and just, you know, that journey, the passion, and kind of for everybody, sort of what you're doing and why it matters. Okay, I'll attempt that. Pete, you are among the world's greatest introducers, so it's always it's a challenge to live up, but I'm going to try to do it. Um, and as you said, I'm a co-founder of Corelight, which is a network security startup, and it's also, it happens to be a spin-out of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So a lot of people in the company used to have .gov in their email address, and, and I did too. I spent about 15 years in the Department of Energy's uh, complex uh, at LBNL. And you, as I reflect back on my career, Pete, um, LBNL, among other things, was just this amazing IoT environment. Um, and in my early years as a fledgling network engineer, I was literally just surrounded by data acquisition devices and control systems. You know this environment really well, accelerator, beamlines, electron microscopes, genomic sequencers, and just all manner of cool and inspiring, truly inspiring mission-oriented science gear. And, and really, it was nearly impossible to do the science without the IoT at LBNL. And this is true of R1 universities and national labs. It's true of Idaho National Lab and, and Stanford Linear Accelerator and, and uh, CERN. Um, and I'm certain that IoT has enabled many, many, many Nobel Prizes over the years. It's sort of the, it's, it's an unsung hero or heroine, but that's the case. Um, and for me, this environment had a big, big impact on my career because it gave birth to a particular approach towards cybersecurity, which at the time was considered sort of eccentric. And you probably remember that from your, your time at DOE headquarters. What are those people at Berkeley doing? And uh, now it's actually become something of a conventional wisdom, but at the time it was eccentric. And, and the security leaders at LBNL had figured out very early that you cannot hope to manage or control every IoT system, every connected data acquisition device running an embedded Windows 95 uh, service. It's just logistically impossible to do that without um, curtailing the mission. And you know, in federal space, we're all about mission. Um, what you can do though, is monitor the traffic. You can analyze the network conversations emitted from IoT devices. You can try to understand what's normal and what's not. You can build a modern, um, and I think optimistic, data-oriented approach to cybersecurity. Um, and in fact, um, some critical software with this perspective was invented at LBNL when I was working there. And at Corelight, we're commercializing that software um, for this exact purpose, to analyze what's happening on networks, to extract data, and to make sense of that data. So um, I'll wind this up. I'll say I never really thought about it until preparing for the workshop, Pete, so I appreciate the opportunity for that reflection. But our company had its roots in this IoT-rich environment within DOE, and so we have, uh, we have we owe everything to IoT, and I appreciate that. Well, Greg, let me jump and just again, like I love to do, because I always have neurons firing and light bulbs happening. So everybody, again, if you didn't hear uh, or capture, there's a lot of acronym in there, but you know, Google <laughs> Core Light, Google uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley, again, one of our 17 national labs. And uh, you know, Greg, from data acquisition, which I know you were kind of hinting at that SCADA ICS world, another acronym I won't spend too much time on. But look, folks, I'm going to bring it back to reality. Saturday night, one of our grids in our power grid was, was physically attacked. And there are people without power in parts of the country. Okay. And that's a physical security issue that hopefully and probably is, and I'm just quoting from what I read in the news, uh, impact on humanity and how we can uh, mitigate that risk and vulnerability by having information so that at a minimum, while we want to catch the bad guys and gals, we can get that power restored. So, 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 you know, network detection and the wonderful work that Greg and his team 
um, is doing. Yes, it's technical and it's a technology, but this IT integration with OT, Greg, you personified, or should I say, you gave a great description and you're always eloquent. So thank you. We'll come back on some of that capability of Cordlight. Ray, floor is yours, buddy. Passion, journey, why this IoT topic matters to you and the great people at Heavy AI. Sure. Uh, thanks, Pete. I appreciate everything you're doing here and the conversation in this incredible panel, really. Um, so I, I, went, I was reminded of a couple of things that uh, Renee was mentioning earlier, and I'll relate that back to what we're doing at Heavy AI. Um, she had mentioned about the, the deep space example and you know, putting that on a network that wasn't, it wasn't intended for. And what that reminds me of is just the supply chain risk in what we do connect to the, to the internet. Um, when I, before uh, uh, Heavy AI, I spent a lot of years at Sun Microsystems and then the acquisition by Oracle of Sun. And one of the things that we were focusing on a lot there was just making sure that we had a secure supply chain. We did have, we did have machines that would go from our secure platform out into the wild and somehow they would try to make it back in through black market or what have you. And there are a lot of times, and Sun and, so, and same with Oracle, takes it very seriously because you're hooking these things up to classified networks at times. I had a situation where someone brought a machine in from the black market that got attached to an air traffic control system. And now think about, and it got, it got was caught, so it was, it was you know, salvaged, but think about the risk in having cyber attacks on our grid or other things through just the uh, lack of awareness of what's happening in our supply chain. And so, you know, when she mentioned the deep space example, uh, that definitely resonated with me very well. Um, one of the other things that uh, I was reminded of is about seven or eight years ago, I, I was uh, able to listen to Elon Musk give a speech at uh, NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And he was putting up, this is, you know, SpaceX was newer at the time. And the thing he, he actually paused the conversation and said, actually, what I'd like to talk about, which is really a risk for government is artificial intelligence and the risk that that can happen. And it correlates to AI and IoT as well. And just the ability to be able to monitor that, keep it under control, make sure that we, as we collect this massive amounts of data, that we're making the best use out of it and that we're um, you know, building the right policies around it. I am encouraged to see and hear, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit more, that you know, there's a lot of initiative going on with DHS and CISA and NIST on the measuring of and the standards of what we do and what we're allowed to attach to our networks. And I think that that's super critical. Um, just a quick example of where my head is today at Heavy AI. What we do is we leverage NVIDIA GPUs to be able to make sense of massive amounts of data. I mean, billions and billions of records where we have examples of some of our customers that were doing data analytics and visualization as one of the things that, that Renee had mentioned earlier as well. You know, the ability to take knowledge and make decisions and then take actions on these massive amounts of data. Um, we can, we're helping customers go from hours or days, or in some cases, we have an example of years worth of analysis of data down to minutes or even less than a second. And so, and what we're doing is we're allowing for them not to have to sample or pre-aggregate or do things that are data that would not let them see the whole corpus of data. Um, and I think that that's gonna be really important too, as, as Greg was mentioned, you can't really do the mission without having all of this data be collected through the IoT devices. And so um, the ability to be able to, to walk through that data, visualize it um, is super important. And so that's one of the missions that we have at, at our company and we're, we're helping customers get there as well. Yeah, Ray, I wanna highlight a few things for the audience. Again, I always talk about the complexity and then you know the clarity, this isn't easy. Uh, right. You brought up supply chain, and while AI, for example, is tremendously uh, uh, important when making sense of data or trying to, or at least just capturing it, you know, it also is risky. And this goes back to Renee with profiles and behaviors and who has that access, right? The social engineering of, you know, your greatest risk is still, I think, human, who you trust on right. the inside, right? But 
you know, you hit on something that I know is a, a big part of what heavy AI brings to the table. And I know this, folks, because I've seen these visualizations. They're amazing. And it's why we're, we're speaking to Ray, you know, where Greg's talking about that. Maybe it's not the sexiest, and I'm not implying it isn't, but network bits, bytes, binaries, whatever you folks uh, who depend on uh, your network experts to protect, uh, there's that visualization. And then they're seeing where the file wildfires are happening, where to put a 5G cell tower, where you can detect what you'll hear later today from Ian Magazine about part of particulates in the air, like a picture's worth a thousand words in heavy AI yeah. does that incredibly well. And that can inform policy. Uh, so I love the, you know, sampling was and still is a way to do it, but having it in real time, Ray, uh, we'll get back to some of that with a use case. So thank you for that and uh, for, for your story. All right, let's pivot to our wonderful PhDs. And I yes, I will keep embarrassing these incredible academics who are storytellers and amazing individuals. Barbara and Michael, I'm going to go to Barbara first, ladies first, but I do want to again highlight a couple things that our audience who is on the chat and and should be, you know, checking some of these things out. Uh, I haven't mastered the art of like pop-ups yet, like in the old MTV videos of the link, but we will get these to you. Um, the Internet of Things information on use by federal agencies. There was a, a GAO report 20-577 you should check out. Uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, I'm honored to be serving now on its Internet of Things advisory board. That's not a shameless plug of me, but it's the efforts from 2020 that Barbara and team have led because NIST has really been bullish on IoT for two years now. And now we have, I think, some momentum. And, and that's something, Barbara, you might want to just kind of contextualize for us. But there are also, there's also NISTIR 8425 just came out in September, profiling IoT core baseline for consumer IoT products. It's a good read. And then most notably, just the other day, uh, actions needed to better secure the internet connected devices, another GAO report. Uh, and I didn't even get into just go out to Google IoT and NIST and you'll find more than you need to read. I want to highlight one more thing. And this is for Michael too, because uh, NISTR and ISTR 8425 is a great read. And it also ties into all of us out there who still love leaning on the executive order 14028, improving the nation's cybersecurity. There was a lot of, there was call out in that executive order post what happened in Colonial, another disaster issue, right? In our country that affected humanity. There are reports and information for those of you who like to read or don't just read the executive summary. NIST is great at that, really great at that. And in plain English, but they tie supply chain software secure, software supply chain security to the executive order. So if you're helping an agency with that executive order 14028 implementation, NIST with IoT and its advisory board and its existing federal IoT working group, it's a story you've got to connect the dots on yourselves. There's no simple solution of why it matters. So more than I wanted to suck air out in introducing, but Barbara, and Michael, let's start with Barbara, a little bit about you, and hopefully I captured some of the important stuff you're working on. Well, thank you. Uh, you captured a lot about the program. Um, my background is I've been at NIST now for 30 years. Uh, the um, bulk of it was uh, with various grant programs that were public-private partnerships the Advanced Technology Program, the Technology Innovation Partnership, and the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace uh, had a grant program. Um, what all of these programs had in common was the, the importance of that public-private partnership, the importance of looking at different perspectives. And that's really uh, critical to the uh, NIST um, Cybersecurity for IoT program. We work with a range of stakeholders. Um, you've mentioned our work on the consumer IoT. Um, for the federal government, we have a NIST special publication 800-213 and 213A. Um, these publications specifically get into the requirements for those federal agencies and looking at uh, what they need to be thinking about as they are 
adding IoT to their federal systems. What these documents also do is bridging that, uh, provide those bridges to the broader NIST guidance on the cybersecurity framework, the risk management framework um, that are looking at federal systems. These once these devices become part of federal systems, all of this guidance applies and how do you move those devices into that space? Um, some of our other guidance, uh, the NIST, um, the baseline technical capabilities for that we've recommended for devices that's aimed at manufacturers, the NIST 8259. Uh, and after this, I'm gonna put all of this in the chat. I'll get you some links. Um, the, uh, <laughs> this, um, this is aimed at manufacturers. So again, the different perspectives. You have the large enterprises like the federal government with, uh, with a IT department, cybersecurity professionals. You have the perspective of consumers. Um, who don't have don't necessarily have any background in cybersecurity. So what does the manufacturer need to do for those consumers? And then you have the general guidance for manufacturers. Again, when we're looking at manufacturers, those product security officers, whose role is very different from the uh, information security officers dealing with the business. And so bringing all of these perspectives to the table to look at IoT cybersecurity from this range of points of view. Um, and that's been a key goal of the program to get that stakeholder involvement to get that range available. So Barbara, uh, I loved everything and folks, we are gonna push some links out. So Barbara, get to typing. I shot out the 8425. <laughs> so uh, please folks, check them out, but please read them. And you will need to understand that while it seems like a lot, it is, it's not easy, but this world we're living in and moving into the, the great uh, uh, insights from, from Dr. Dunaway, I wanna just thank Barbara for highlighting partnership, open government, being collaborative, transparent, you know, working together and participating. NIST folks, as we all know them to be, always seem to be having a seat at the table from testimony to working groups because they are that connector to industry. They know how policy and federal government will, a policy or, or what have you, will impact the sectors that are really operated and maintained and owned by, by, by private sector. Remember, 16 critical infrastructures, not agencies, as DHS defines, are the very sectors that we depend on. Water, food, health, manufacturing, dams, uh, energy, transportation, okay? That's the humanity side. What NIST does and what uh, these wonderful folks and Greg and Ray are doing is trying to help, you know, save lives, keep networks safe and uh, not act as though they're silver bullets. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Michael, do your thing. You have a lot of expanse in terms of global perspective, but uh, Please take your time and, and let folks know all the great work and access you have to where IoT is impacting the world. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate it. Um, so Pete loves to open these introductions by embarrassing people to whatever degree he can. He always hits the PhD thing for me. Um, as a former naval officer, you know, there's certain audiences you never mentioned that you have a PhD in, and this is one I can get away with that. Um, but I remember the, the, the reason I raised this is because I, I was at the Department of Homeland Security uh, a few years ago, standing up a program on community resilience. Uh, this was post 9-11, and we were trying to figure out how to protect local. My job was how do we protect local communities and enable them to more better uh, develop the, the methods to protect citizens and their property and economic viability, a whole range of things. And at the same time, I was working on this doctorate at George Washington University in systems engineering and risk analysis. And I remember at the time, my advisor telling me, someday you'll be glad you did this. And it's taken a long time to get to that, to get to that point. But right now, working in the smart cities uh, arena at NIST, 
uh, helping to lead the program in smart cities. Uh, I feel like I finally have arrived at the point where everything I look at is a, is a system. And a city itself is just a huge systems engineering problem. Uh, and, and the interesting dimension is that the components range from sensors, obviously, sensors that send data and send data to other sensors. And then that data flows up to uh, systems that maintain city operations, whether it's water control or traffic management or uh, police notifications or uh, community awareness uh, through, through dashboards, things of that nature. And all of that information then relates to the human system and the outcomes that we're trying to develop for society. And what NIST is involved in principally in the smart cities arena is because NIST is a, is, is, is a laboratory, is a Department of Commerce laboratory that specializes in measurement science. So what do we measure and how do we measure it? And in the smart city arena, what we're really trying to develop at this point is helping cities understand the relationships between the sensor systems the infrastructure systems, the data flows. Um, and then that's on the built environment side. And then there is the natural environment side where we're also doing as, as, as we pointed out, I think Renee pointed out, an, an awful lot of environmental monitoring with sensors to try to determine not only what is the temperature today, but what is the temperature gonna be five years from now or even the next season? Uh, and how can, we, how can we manage the city's relationship to that environment and maybe contribute, contribute something beneficial to the environment or at the least prevent, prevent contributing deleterious effects to the environment by minimizing uh, impacts through what, we're measure, through what we're measuring and how we're controlling the, uh, the, the human infrastructure and the, and the built environment. Um, we just recently published a, a document that's going back in March now, <clears throat> March of last year, a document on uh, key performance indicators for smart cities. And the goal of that document is to build a framework that enables cities to kind of understand the relationships between the IoT systems and their infrastructures and the, the natural environment and the population, the human population and the outcomes that we're trying to seek. So it, it gets down to how do we measure things and what do we measure? But in many cases, some of the intangibles, like for instance, in the cybersecurity realm, trust, trustworthiness of systems, uh, how much we trust the sensors, how much we trust the data the sensors are sending us, how much we trust the decisions that, that's, that the data is, is, is serving to uh, enable. And in some cases, particularly in the smart city arena, how much do we trust the decision makers? And do we understand that they are acting in our behalf as a city system, as an entire system? And how much are we seeing the benefits of the decisions that are being made by the, by the city government uh, and the city, uh, the city leadership? And what is the role of the citizens to contribute to that situation? So a whole range of, of interconnectedness, whole range of data flows, and uh, a whole range of a new, under, new level of understanding about how these, uh, these internet of things systems uh, relate to one another and relate to us as human beings and relate to our community and the population at large. So we'll stop there. No, wonderful, Michael. And again, for our audience, the, the, this guidance, this uh, understanding the difference between words like resilience and reliability are important. And again, NIST isn't selling anything, they're sharing what the industry needs from government, how the government can help. And then hopefully that influences companies like Greg and Ray, uh, you know, to, to build their technology roadmaps around this, where the puck's going. So Michael, we're going to come back. And I know we're at 956, but folks, this is part of it. If you have questions who are listening in, please use the chat. I see some coming in directed to an individual. These folks between their airtime uh, are happy to respond on some specific questions. Andy Bachman, do what you do, contextualize and tell about where you've been and where you are in this world and what you're hearing internationally and nationally and, and, and a little bit of the risk, but also the opportunity of IoT. It's funny, I heard you mention um, the uh, attack on the substations in North Carolina and uh, for people that have are tuned into these things for a while and have been working cyber forever, uh, when the Metcalf substation attack happened, that got uh, everybody super energized and even caused some to question, well, what, 
why are we doing all this cyber stuff when all you have to do is go in with a rifle and start shooting around or throw a brick over a fence in an urban substation? Uh, maybe our priorities are mixed up. And since then, there hasn't been that much, at least, uh, physical attack on infrastructure assets in the United States that's made it to the public that was that significant. Certainly, it's happening in Ukraine every single day now, big time. And it's informing as we try to come up with uh, helps for them uh, from an architecture point of view and certainly from an equipment point of view. Uh, we're also thinking about ourselves and our other allies and how would how would we deal with these types of things? How would we can reconfigure? Again, this is mainly on the the physical side of things, but all of it is now hopelessly intertwined on the the cyber and physical. So, um, hello, P, hello, fellow panelists, and everybody that's uh, that's attending. My job is to be. I mean, I didn't know this when I was going to be born when I was born, but my my job is to be the voice of caution. Um, I'm a promoter of resilience and diversity, and definitely diversity on the human side, but also uh, on the technological side. The minute we get all excited about one particular application, see solar winds, uh, or if there's a particular suite of sensors all made by the same vendor with the same basic internals, and we deploy 10 billion of them, then that's just a wonderful um, uh, target for adversaries who can go to school on one thing and potentially have impacts uh, massively uh, out, out of scale uh, impacts more broadly. Um, I'm from Idaho National Lab. It's been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, I've been there for a little while. Its fortes are nuclear energy research uh, development and testing, including testing to fail. And it is now one of the centers of the universe for the development of small modular reactors and micro reactors which uh, may give us a fighting chance to both uh, keep the grid stable, uh, which we're not doing such a great job at right now, <laughs> independent of people shooting at it, and uh, as well as to deploy uh, carbon-free or um, low-carbon uh, generating stuff so that then we can put renewables on top of it. All of that stuff is massively sensor-dependent and massively uh, Internet of Things-dependent too. I don't know if we did a formal definition uh, at any point in this, but for my cybersecurity tribe people, uh, the uh, the word internet is a four letter word, uh, and so Internet of Things is just compounded that that concern uh, for them. That's it's an anathema of sorts. But as Greg and and others have said, it's a uh, it's it's the world we live in. So deal with it. Don't just keep saying, "Oh, don't do it." It's happened already. Uh, so so get used to it. So oh, hopefully somebody uh, will pick up that phone in this guest house that I'm visiting. Yeah, ahead, well, well, no, Andy, all good. And, and it's funny you mentioned four-letter word. I was giving a talk years ago with folks at NIST and si at the um, cyber event in Minnesota. And I'll never remember our panel uh, was to talk about, hey, the promise of IoT. This was like five years, four or five years ago. Yeah. And in the room, it was uh, a bunch of operators, utility operators. And I remember I kind of got a sense like, I don't think this is the normal folks or group that I speak to about innovation and, and promise. And before I got going, the title was like, IOT, changing the utility sector for the better. Some guy stood up and said, IOT is Satan. And I said, well, that's going to pivot the entire conversation for the next four hours. So I get it. And uh, look, this is that challenge of educating, informing, and enlightening. So you know, folks, Andy has this grid knowledge. He's a strategist. Yes, he, he works at INL, but he works with all the labs. And please read his stuff, his books, his insights. He's, like I said, he's helping me understand the impact of climate environmental uh, activity on data centers for all of our government folk here. He and I are working with the sustainability officers in government to kind of socialize and be evangelists and ambassadors for what you need to know. And there's a lot to know. And, and you hit on the distri uh, distributed energy resource integration, renewables now becoming a part of our grid. And that's not necessarily the IT side of that integration discussion. So, right, right. so, so Andy, you know, chat, send things out. I'm asking our panelists, you know, give people things to read and understand versus, you know, trying to capture every minute or, or word you say. All right, pivoting back to Greg and Ray. Greg and Ray, uh, this is the part where I would love to hear uh, from our industry partners. Uh, we have some use cases later in the day specifically, but I, I want to give you this chance of what you've heard so far. And obviously your, your, 
your journey background and, and passion for this has been clearly uh, articulated. But uh, is there uh, an example, Greg, where a recent vulnerability or something cyber related happened? And I want to say, you know, you and your culture came to to help mitigate the risk and and kind of rescue the situation. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I'd love to give specific examples in agencies, but that's sometimes quite difficult in the cybersecurity context. Agencies don't don't really um, want a lot of information about tooling they use disclosed. Um, sure. Although many of the agencies mentioned today already are, are core like customers. But let me just um, refer to a story that's been in the news in the last couple of weeks. Um, Microsoft, I think just two weeks ago, released findings about a supply chain attack um, uh, that was novel and really pervasive. They released a global map showing vulnerabilities against it that, that pretty much touched every corner of the world. And it was about IoT devices running an embedded web server called BOA, um, as in BOA constrictor. I had never heard of the BOA web server. You probably hadn't either. Maybe Andy had, but it's because it was quite obscure and development on it had been ceased in 2005. And yet it was easy to install. It was available, lightweight, had a lot of properties that made it very attractive to embed in a router or webcam or in any number of other kinds of devices. And indeed it was riddled with a number of severe vulnerabilities. Um, and it kind of divided the world into a couple of, of different camps. There were organizations that were already collecting the data that they needed to be able to tell quickly and efficiently if they were vulnerable, if they had these BOA web servers in their environments and there were organizations that weren't. Um, and we, in an, in an in an event like this, what Corelight tries to do, what our company tries to do is understand if there's a simple way that our customers um, can detect this sort of vulnerability. Um, and if possible, we'll open source this detection solution. We'll open source what's required um, for anyone in the world to make that same kind of detection. And that's what we did a couple of weeks ago. You can read about the technical details on our blog post, but structurally, we discovered that folks who had installed Corelight sensors or even had installed the open source software that we are commercializing at Corelight, and that's thousands of organizations globally, could just look at the data they are already detecting, they're already collecting, and understand how vulnerable they were, and then they could really short circuit this problem. Um, and so we published the, the, um, the detection necessary, which is quite simple for people to do this work in their environments um, globally. And, and I think what that shows is really the power of this open source mindset and the idea of sort of communally oriented cybersecurity defense. Um, together, we can crowdsource solutions that can respond to new vulnerabilities as they emerge. And if we're collecting data about what's happening in our environment, that's really the most one of the most important cybersecurity investments we can make. It's one of the most strategic. So that's virtuous cycle of the release of information about a compromise and then the release of the key to detecting that compromise um, and the public dissemination of that is the kind of thing we try to get involved with at Corelight and really shorten that cycle so that folks can move from the disclosure to the to the defense very rapidly. So Greg, for you and for, I'm gonna say for Andy, uh, specifically Barbara and Michael, I saw some head nodding, please the, uh, you know, we don't have scripted questions, but I would have, I would welcome a riffing off some of the things that these practitioners are, are, are doing to, to without, you know, naming names, but globally impacting organizations to help mitigate risk to their environments. You know, Barbara brought up the cybersecurity framework, the risk management framework. Again, folks, these are taxonomies on the, in the audience uh, that you should be using to look at your own risk posture. So, um, you know, please, please make sense of, uh, you know, or try to make sense of what we're trying to convey here. And that is, these are practitioners, these are policy developers, and then there's fo there are folks like Andy, who does uh, a number of things, but but bringing to bear what we can learn from these uh, use cases. So awesome stuff there, Greg. You also didn't say the words, but I'm going to say this is Ray, you're next. So you got the same question. So opportunity to anonymize, but talk about where you're helping, whether it's federal, state, local, or even commercial. Uh, there was a challenge and there was an opportunity to come in and mitigate risk. Zero trust, perimeter, perimeter lists, environments, you can't associate zero trust without talking IoT folks. And, you know, in cloud, on-prem, on the device, you're using IoT every day. And that's back to my little conversation with Michael about my poll I've been running. There's no, when will it be here? It is here. And there are social, economic, 
Uh, there are equities that have to be examined in addition to the coolness of the tech. So, um, Greg, Greg, you, you said it without saying it, but there's a lot to think about when you bring in a company and a solution from the product to the people who know what they're talking about. And shout out to Corelight for embedding that into their DNA. Ray, floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah, it's so much of what's being said resonates today uh, as I think about some of the things that we're helping customers do or some of the th challenges that we see. Um, you know, I just talk about the challenges and, and some of the things that we're doing to help and, and where some of this comes from. Uh, about five years ago, just as a, a baseline, I had uh, the fortune of having uh, Stephanie O'Sullivan be my advisor. Uh, Stephanie O'Sullivan was the uh, PD, DNI, the principal deputy director of national intelligence. So she was the number two person in the intelligence community. And for about a year, she was my advisor at Adobe. One of the things that she did, um, you know, uh, after she had retired from that role, would talk to us about some of the things that we could do to help the government. And she said, and I, I'll never forget, she said, the most important thing you can do is help the government get better use out of their data. And there were three components to that. It was the data scale, the decision confidence, as we were talking about earlier, and the time sensitivities, right? So on the data scale side, you know, Customers right now, they have just so much massive amounts of data and so many more sensors that are coming online as we're talking about today. And as Mike, Michael was saying, um, you know, the interconnectivity of these sensors and how they talk to each other. And so the need for the ability to explore these larger data sets and cover a larger area of interest is really important. Um, the second thing is decision confidence, right? What is the ability to fully know what happened and then how to respond. And that lack of ability has caused challenges as well. So what do folks need to do, what government needs to do, is to be able to converge multiple data sets. It's not just a single data set or a sampling of a, of a data set. It's multiple data sets for more holistic decision-making ability. And then this third thing is time sensitivities, right? So the inability at times in, in the past to respond in a timely manner because the current systems just cannot respond to these, the previous two things that we just talked about, the data scale and the decision confidence. It's slow with maybe the systems are incapable. And so they need a faster decision-making uh, and an ability in the things that we talk about are life and property. Um, so one of our customers, I won't go into the specifics, but one of our customers is, is DHS. And they came to us with some challenges on just a massive scale. They wanted to take three systems and put them on one single pane of glass to be able to look at uh, you know, multimodal or risk analysis systems that they currently would have to go from one screen to the next and try and correlate those things. So we helped them do that. It takes their decision-making process down from, from days to just seconds. Uh, it gives them a more complete view. It gives them the faster decision-making and the ability to tip and queue if needed. And so the, the ability to do that for customers is very common. And again, I think the, um, the need to be able to even address these larger data policy questions that are coming up, you know, how do we store this data? How do we structure the data? How do we make sure that there's some standards so that they can interconnect is something that I think that we're, um, I'm seeing much more of today and our customers are, are, are asking for that help as well. So let me do two things for the audience because there was yeah. a reason we have this partnership and I'm coming to Andy next. Some of his comments he's putting in the chat around data centers might resonate with the Beltway. Heavy AI, and this is from their websites. This is why I think you know facts tell, but stories tell, but sometimes simplicity is really what can convey value. Every product does something special. Everybody who works with me post-government and when I was a CTO at DOE, I know companies have something special. Sometimes I like to drill Get that point across and marry it to the mission that you're selling into. And these two guys and their companies do it well. And by the way, Heavy AI, formerly known as Omni Psy, also has Omni great root. Yeah, also has some great roots with. Um, uh, I just I just drew a blank there. The the DoD and uh, we're uh, an Incutel company. Incutel, yeah, so Incutel. Yeah. I was too getting ahead of myself. Too much caffeine, but great DNA there. Heavy AI helps enterprise and public sector make time sensitive keyword phrase, high impact decisions with big data, and also uh, decision confidence 
aligns nicely with the federal IT operating plan from the federal CIO council data as a strategic asset. Loosely used term, it is data with context is information. Visualization does that. Good job, heavy AI. And core light, think of these words for all you geeks out there. Our network detection and response, NDR acronym, technology helps defend some of the world's most sensitive mission critical organizations. Go read about them. They're doing it every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Awesome stuff. Andy Bachman, I'm jumping to you. You've been talking a little bit about data centers. You're tightly engaged with sustainability discussions, both commercially and in government. You and I are two dudes in a truck running around making sure that the IT side of the house understands climate and environmental impact. Frame a lot of this data center passion you have, and you have some great examples of things that happen in other countries. Maybe we should have a food truck at some point. Ah. I mean, everybody, Everybody's doing it. I love it. I love it. And if you're successful, you can turn it into a restaurant. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, so all this discussion about data, right? I'm thinking about in the climate context, uh, one of the great uh, and authoritative sources of making sense of all the data is the IPCC. And their sixth round of reports that uh, came out uh, last year and this, uh, you know, are pretty emphatic that there's no longer any room for doubt uh, why the atmosphere is going up and why the atmosphere is heating and therefore the air, the ocean's heating and we're experiencing global weird, weirding extreme weather events in places that they didn't used to happen or with a force that they didn't, didn't used to happen before. So the IPCC, you know, it's uh, basing its projections and its cautions on what the supercomputers are telling us that are running at NOAA and NCAR and some of the national labs. They're crunching data in these giant supercomputing sensors, uh, centers, but they're pulling from sensors in the atmosphere, in the oceans, and on land. And those sensors are IoT devices, right? Um, IoT devices are, I think, uh, the poster child, whether it's some, you know, for, for regular people, it would be the NIST thermostat on their house, the smart meters that the utilities deployed uh, with great gusto recently, charging stations that are coming online for EVs and a bunch of other things. Uh, and out of all this, we make smart cities and smart toasters and smart everything. But you don't get to have any of the smarts uh, without reliably functioning data centers. And they have been reliable. They have problems all the time, but they fail over into other activity zones uh, for most customers that could afford that level of redundancy, and uh, the world keeps turning. However, the climate's coming back uh, to uh, impact this world that we've built in terms of heat and heat waves and heat waves that don't leave called heat domes. And so here's the key point. I would go on too long if I don't stop myself. All of the buildings that we've built today and many that we instrument with sensors and run with building management systems uh, from the most pedestrian type of uh, building residential to really, you know, huge towers and fab plants, they're all built for a different uh, world. They were built to codes that were based on the likely extreme conditions of the past. And those likely extreme conditions of the past are not what is landing now in 2022 and certainly uh, is greatly exceeded, will be greatly exceeded in 2025, 2030, 2035, and 40. Which means that all of this stuff, which all my tribe has been so concerned about from a cyber vector, they need to be, I'm not saying they should go to sleep on that, um, has a, something else coming at it uh, that people aren't paying attention to. Most people aren't paying attention to. And if we want to keep working, going to have to look at retrofitting the data centers, HVAC systems, and all kinds of other stuff. So I'm not saying quit your day job. Please keep doing what you're doing. But be aware that uh, out in your, outside your peripheral vision, something is coming at this that we that we weren't expecting. We need to attend to that also proactively. Well said. And I see Greg nodding. I'm going to come to Barbara, and then I'm going to go to Michael. I saw a couple of questions come in about smart cities. And folks, look, smart cities is way cool to talk about. Google smart city anatomy, and you'll see that it all needs to be built from the ground up too often. We plug in something and say, hey, it's magically going to work. I spent time in Pittsburgh a few weeks ago with federal CIO council folks and just the traffic monitoring and the, the really great work coming out of that wonderful city. We'll hear more from me in magazine later. You don't, and I know everyone knows this, but plug in something and collecting data. At some point, you got to say, well, what do I do with all this? 
And then what does it mean to me? And then how do I convey that back to society? So uh, Andy, I know that you could talk for hours on this, but folks, again, he is bridging the ITOT conundrum, but also a real world example of how you have to convene the right people, put them in a room and, and it's, it's not get stuff done. There's another word I use an S word, but, but GSD there. Barbara, do you mind jumping in and giving folks here who aren't really aware of the fact that there are federal IOT working groups in government and then this new role with the advisory board and what that's going to do over the next year? Sure. Um, the so uh, the federal the IOT federal working group um, is it has about uh, nineteen federal agencies have become involved with it. And that is looking at um, the use of IOT across the federal government, also um, looking at barriers to the use of IOT in the broader economy. And for that, again, this comes back to the whole question that we need lots of different perspectives. So the IOT advisory board um, is a is a federal advisory board that is um, standing up, that is just getting stood up, and it is looking, that is its role, its, its charter, is to identify barriers to the use of IoT and getting the benefits of IoT across the broader economy. Uh, and that's um, while the legislation starting the uh, calling for this um, federal working group and advisory board, both of which have to write reports. Uh, the advisory board writes its recommendations and provides them to the federal working group who then have the opportunity to comment on those recommendations. Um, but the idea is that you need all those different perspectives. You need it across a range of industries, a range of sectors, range of technology, um, points of view, as well as consumer, nonprofits, business points of view, uh, to get at what are these barriers. There are so much promise to IoT and to what might be done, um, but what are the barriers and what are the barriers that the federal government can particularly help with? Um, yep. especially as agencies better coordinate. Yeah, so Barbara and team and everybody listening, you know, get involved. Uh, our working group at ACT IACT, for example, our IoT working group, the Smart City Working Group, the infrastructure, I mean, we call, I don't know what we call ourselves, but we're really just, we're that group within the emerging tech community of interest. We're a resource and a place for those who want to come and share stories so we can elevate and celebrate kind of like we're doing today. Uh, Barbara, a shout out again to you, your leadership and NIST for doing this. I know it's 9, 10, 20. I might go a little over because we did start a little late, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to Michael Dunaway. He's going to talk about the incredible people that he is working with and leading a cadre of folks I'm blessed to be a part of who are the super clusters. Uh, this isn't about you know, my role, Michael. Talk about the great people we meet with and the, the places you're traveling and the work they're doing for free to kind of move this forward and how to get involved. And then we're going to do our parting shots, which is for everybody to leave the audience with something they took away from today. Okay. So uh, Michael, maybe a minute or two. Sure. Thanks, Pete. Um, so the funnest thing about this job that I have uh, in the smart cities community at NIST is that uh, I, I basically am the point source for a federal public private partnership with communities. And I'm the federal member of that partnership. And I'm working with about, we have about 200 cities around the country that have been members of the Global City Teams Challenge or Technology Challenge, it's called, um, over the last seven years or so. And we've got about 40 international partners as well, and some very sophisticated ones, like as you might imagine, Singapore, uh, uh, Barcelona, Spain, and a number of others. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that the, the so the, it's a public-private partnership, one federal office, which is mine, uh, but the communities are all organized around specific problems that they have that was that would initiated them to try to try to to identify technologies that could help them solve their community problem. 
And some of those are very mundane, like how do we ensure that the uh, that, that we can optimize the trash truck routes and not go to trash cans that have been dumped twice already? How can we identify potholes that roads need to be you know that need to be fixed? How can we solve traffic problems? How do we monitor weather for uh, for a flood control during a flood season, et cetera, et cetera? More recently, one of the programs that we have stood up in the Global City Teams Challenge is the DEI and T program. So diversity, equity, integrity, and technology. So it's a riff kind of in the smart city community on the diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and accessibility. DEI and A, I think, is the federal nomenclature. So we've done that from an integrity perspective and from a technology perspective. So the questions we're trying to answer are, how can we use technologies to improve social cohesion, to more equitably distribute the benefits and the outcomes of all this smart city investment that communities are making? How can we enable uh, administrations to justify to their public exactly why they're gaining the benefit and how much that benefit uh, costs them? And then what are the cost savings? What are the returns on that investment? So a whole range of those kind of things. I'll give you one really good example. Um, we are working, just beginning to work with Native American communities and tribal communities, uh, tribal regions. Um, we, we have a lot of discussion in the country about extending 5G connectivity because we recognize and have certainly recognized from the pandemic that 5G and connectivity to the network equates to kids continuing to go to school when they're in quarantine. Well, in the, in the Native American community, it's not about 5G, it's about 3G. Mm. It's about connect connectivity at all to the benefits of a technological advanced society that America is. And we have a lot of neighborhoods and communities and even regions of the country that are simply left out of that equation. So the goal of this diversity, equity, integrity, and technology initiative is to build a greater degree of integrity in our own programs and in the communities themselves for social cohesion and do that through the application of technology in those areas. So that's just one example of what we're doing in that in that area. Rock on, get involved folks, just Google Michael. All right, uh, in the spirit of, uh, let's, let's firecracker parting shots. 30 seconds or less, if you can, what do you wanna leave with the audience? Greg, Ray, Andy, Barbara, and Michael. And yes, when we're done, I want a Serona selfie and people smiling because when you try to do it when everybody's on screen, somebody's always smiling and somebody's doing something else. So we're doing that. Greg, floor is yours, parting shot. 30 seconds. Okay. Most of the things we care about in life, to be honest, are now dependent on IoT systems. I mean, to Andy's point, there's climate science, but also healthcare, education, research, commerce, transportation, city life. And I think as with climate change, it's really important to maintain well, to avoid a doom and gloom perspective and maintain optimism, we can embrace the promise of these IoT systems and we can minimize cyber risk. We do need a new security approach. It's data centric, it's balanced. That's what we're working on here at Corelight. And we also think, I think we need better public private partnerships and conversations, more ambassadors that can work across these boundaries. So that's one reason I'm grateful to you, Pete, and for this forum. So thank you for the invitation. And I hope that was 30 seconds. Uh, doesn't matter. That's just a set of bar. Awesome words. You're the man, Greg. Can't wait to see and get you get a bro hug from you. Okay. Ray, you're up. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I just really appreciated the conversation and the connectivity here on what everyone is talking about. Uh, when you think about the infrastructure bill and what that means and the ability to make decisions faster, make informed decisions, even just the most recent comment was with respect to 5G. There are, there are ways that we can plan and deploy networks better for the United States based on the data and informed decisions, which then increases the speed of velocity to take the actions that we determine are appropriate. And, and especially in light of the economy and some of the things we're uh, you know, dealing with with inflation, to do those in a cost-effective way. Informed decisions, saving the most money possible while increasing the access to uh, network and information so that we can uh, have a better informed citizenry, but also affect the client, the, the climate as well, and, and some of the other things that go along with that. So, I think there was a lot of things to follow up here on, and I'm, I'm really excited for that as well. Yep. Ray is a fellow Montgomery County guy, so shout out to MoCo. Ray, I'll see you soon. Yeah. Andy, yes. floor's yours. 
Okay, all I want to say is that uh, for years, people of the cybersecurity orientation, whenever you'd be on a talk about some exciting new technology, everyone seemed like they weren't aware that there was even a potential risk going on because they were just talking about the new capabilities and maybe the new money too that would come from the new technology. My favorite thing about this panel is that everybody seems fully cyber aware, like fully aware that yeah, we're going to do these great things or we are doing these great things that need to be done with uh, IoT and related technologies. But I didn't hear anybody sound like they were blissfully uh, unaware on another planet that also they're carrying some of that caution in their heads, even as they're talking about these things. So uh, that would be all four of you, Greg, Gray, Michael and Barbara. I really appreciated uh, hearing that sentiment come through when you were saying your piece. Thank you, Andy. I will see you next week inside the Beltway as your travels take you through our nation's capital. You're the man. Love you like a brother. I'm going to end with Barbara because ladies first and ladies last. So, Michael, parting shot. Just to have a, a, a comment based on Greg's point about optimism, and um, and 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 also Andy's point about about awareness of risks and things of that nature. So if, if you're carrying a cell phone or wearing a, a, a smartwatch, you know, you may or may not be, but you're almost certainly carrying a cell phone. You are a node in a, an IoT network. <laughs> we all are. Uh, and it's us who are aware of that fact, but also aware of the risks and aware of the hazards that that brings, but also the advantages that that brings along with us that maintain a sense of optimism about the technology and the advantages that that technologies, that these technologies can bring. Um, that's where the real strength of this initiative comes from or this whole effort. I mean, the, 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 the movement towards building an IoT nation, IoT based nation is well underway. And we're already, not only are we on the path, we essentially have already done it. We're just now refining it and expanding its capabilities. And I think it's it's important to keep an optimistic sense about the benefits that we can gain from that at the same time that we're wary about the risks and the uh, and the downside. But uh, but that's how you maintain control over the situation. So uh, I really appreciated the opportunity to be on this panel and to talk with everyone. So thanks, Pete. You got it, Brother Mike, Dr. Mike. Uh, Barbara, Dr. Barbara, close us out. <laughs> OK. Um our, uh, our lead for the uh, Cybersecurity for IoT program set the core principles, and I'd like to end with those, um, that Cybersecurity for IoT needs to be risk-based. Um, it needs to reflect the fact that no device is in a vacuum. There are, this, everything is system-based. No one size fits all for cybersecurity, that you need stakeholder engagement, broad stakeholder engagement. There are so many different points of view. Um, when we're all nodes in the IoT network, then we all have a point of view. And that, uh, and that each approach has to be outcome-based, that there's no, again, back to that no one size fits all, there's no one approach that's going to work across the board. So it needs to, cybersecurity needs to be defined in terms of outcomes, not how to reach those outcomes. Well said, love it. Everybody who listened, all those were tweetable moments. Uh, lady and gents, let's do a command shift F3. Give me a smile on three, everybody. One, two, three. You're awesome. I can't thank you all enough. We're gonna take a, a little one or two minute break before we go to our next segments. But I just want to thank everybody who uh, attended that first session. You're going to hear some great stories next. But shout out to Greg and Andy and Barbara and Michael and Ray. I mean, get to know these people. Look them up on LinkedIn. Amazing thought leaders, change agents, and people who just want to get stuff done. But stuff isn't the word. Love everybody on this panel. Talk to you all soon. Thank you, Pete. See you guys. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Pete. Hey, Jackie, uh, just in the spirit of keeping it real, should we take a break or do you want to roll right in? I think we can roll right in. Love it. I'm caffeinated and I don't need a break. So uh, hopefully uh, uh, we, we will just do that. All right. So I now am pivoting into where I get to sit back and listen, take some notes, go off screen. Uh, I get to introduce Ian Magazine. Uh, 
I use this phrase not all the time, but but uh, I got to know Ian many, many moons ago. He is uh, somebody I admire, respect, and really have helped fashion my career around. He's the ultimate connector in the spirit of Malcolm Gladwell. He knows everybody and anybody, not just in the energy space and in Pittsburgh, but he's a financial uh, uh, whiz. He's an entrepreneur, and he is, of course, the president and CEO of Airviz. I can't wait for you to hear his story. I will embarrass him a little bit because Ian and I spent about a year working together, and without him, I wouldn't, even though family is rooted in the great, great city of Pittsburgh, I mean, he's gotten me into places simply because his Rolodex is uh, one that I hope one day I have that size, but incredible, incredible uh, individual. You're going to hear uh, to me how he has now taken helm of a company that is everything you heard about today, leveraging IoT and data to, among other things, make sure that the air we breathe keeps us and our lives extended. Okay, this is about critical infrastructure and technology extending life. So, Ian Magazine, you're going to do your thing. All I'll ask is give people a little bit of introduction on your passion, your pro, the promise of your company, but let people know a bit about your awesome pedigree. Love you, dude. Oh, thanks, Pete. <clears throat> and thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And, and to start off, a heartfelt thank you. Uh, for all of you um, who spend your days solving problems for the greater good. Uh, my, my admiration uh, for what you do is, 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 is very heartfelt. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I have a Wall Street background, uh, left Wall Street to become the first employee of what became Nextel Communications, uh, learned the art of the possible, uh, and uh, literally took that idea, built a company and a team around it, scaled it, um, and, and, and had a great um, exit early on in, in mobile communications. Uh, right now, I'm the CEO of AirViz. Uh, AirViz is an early stage, and I mean early stage, uh, Carnegie Mellon University uh, spinoff. We're a pioneer in air quality monitoring, and we're using IoT technology uh, to protect the world's greatest asset, uh, its people, uh, from the greatest risk to human health, which is air pollution. Uh, next slide, please. Airviz uh, brought to market the SPEC sensor, uh, which was one of the first affordable indoor air quality monitors. And we're all about uh, partnerships and collaboration. Uh, 3M uh, and Airviz partnered together to develop the sensor hardware uh, and firmware and algorithms for the award-winning uh, Filtrate smart air filters. Next slide, please. Nothing is essential to life as breathing. People forget that. I mean, hold your breath for 30 seconds. 99% uh, of the global population and 92.8% of the US population breathes unhealthy air. And we monitor what we eat and drink, but not what we breathe. And those costs are colossal. Air pollution kills 7 million people. A, um, next slide, please. I'm sorry. Air pollution kills 7 million people annually, costing the global economy $8.1 trillion. At today's pollution levels, the average person loses 2.2 years of their life. And if nothing changes, that's 17 billion lost years. And we breathe. Uh, next slide, please. We breathe an enormous amount of air a day, about 20,000 breaths. Uh, and with each breath we take, we breathe in millions of tiny particles, gases, and vapors. And if that air can, has contaminants and pollutants, even at moderate levels, chronic exposure to air pollution could severely affect our health, especially for our vulnerable populations. And due to their small size, many air pollut pollutants can move from the lungs to the bloodstream damaging the heart, lungs, brain, and other body org organs. Uh, for asthma alone, uh, there's 13.8 million school days uh, and 14.2 million work days missed, and 10 million outpatient and 2 million emergency room visits just from asthma alone. Next slide, please. 
If we can't measure it, we can't manage it. Next slide, please. Air quality control is essential to protecting our, our people, our assets from exposure to harmful pollutants, contamination, or physical damage. AirVis has dedicated years of research in partnership with Carnegie Mellon University into proprietary, advanced, scalable IoT sensing technology. Our IoT sensors and software enable low-cost sensors to become high-fidelity devices with the economics for effective geographic coverage to create the most extensive, secure, and reliable data set of air data. Next slide, please. Every solution gives decision makers automated decision tools and high resolution data to provide robust, hyper local, hyper responsive air quality analytics to manage current and evolving air pollution and climate change challenges. Next slide, please. We heard from we heard from the previous panel that it's great to have all this data, uh, but what you actually what what do you actually do with it? And one of the things I think that makes us unique is our solution goes beyond gathering data. We deliver predictive analytics to forecast what could happen and prescriptive analytics to show where, when, and how to intervene at the micro and macro levels. We give decision makers a tool to actually solve problems, not just identify them, allowing them to identify hotspots, enforce policies, and implement incentives. You know, a really good example of that is there are about 6 million old wood burning so stoves um, in the US, 20 old wood stoves can emit more than 2.5 more than more than a, a more than a ton of pm 2.5 pollution during cold months changing out one stove is equivalent to taking out five old diesel trucks off the road and also things like how to prioritize upgrading mass transit adjusting the timing of surfer, of certain traffic lights and revised mapping apps from routing traffic down uh, certain streets or by ball, ball, ball fields, parks, and schools. Next slide, please. Our sensors are analogous to diagnostic tools like an X-ray or CT scan, while reference grade monitors are like an MRI. Our combo plus sensor, as you see here, it's compared to you can see the size compared to uh, a business card. They're pretty compact and small. It's like an x-ray. It gives us an inside look to diagnose any environment. Uh, next slide, please. Our new duo is like a CAT scan. It actually identifies problems that are too subtle to see. The duo is capable of measuring the very tiny and more dangerous particles at 10 times smaller than the current standard. And it's the only low cost sensor uh, that monitors lung deposit service area, which is a much better indicator of air pollutants toxicity. And we have plenty of other uh, sensors in our pipeline. Next slide, please. Our IoT sensors have been monitoring many US critical infrastructure sectors, such as the chemical, energy, waste, um, and transportation sectors. Next slide, please. I guess it's missing a slide. Um, just this, this is important. So AirNow is the EPA real-time air quality program that provides real-time air quality data and forecasts to protect the public health across the United States. Uh, it, the slide that's missing, it, it actually shows you a map of AirNow and you could, and, and there's only one PM 2.5 monitor that provides air quality data for the Miami metropolitan area with over 6 million people and over 1,000 square miles of land area. And air quality varies from street to street and neighborhood to neighborhood and constantly changes throughout the day. Actually, the air quality in my office is different than the air quality in the kitchen, which is definitely different than the air quality in the bathroom. 
And even if the air quality index is satisfactory, it doesn't mean that the air is safe to breathe uh, for all, all the time in all neighborhoods. Uh, AirVis is in, in the process of a trial deployment, working with a wireless provider um, partner to deploy IoT sensors in numerous locations throughout the Miami metropolitan area to evaluate air quality at the hyperlocal level. Next slide, please. Actually, stay here. I'm sorry. Can you go back? Yeah. So, um, and let's talk a little bit about indoor. So, our, our IoT sensors have been monitoring healthcare, manufacturing, production, um, and food pro and the food processing sectors. Uh, specifically, talking about healthcare, M McGee Women's Hospital uh, here, here, here in Pittsburgh uh, purchased AirVis sensors and analysis tools to study the impact of air quality on prenatal health. Their research shows how air quality strongly correlates with pregnant mothers and birth complications, uh, such as increased miscarriages, premature births, low birth weights, um, and being born with a disability. Next slide, please. The third use case I'd like to talk about is, is climate change. We often treat climate change um, and air pollution as separate issues. And the sources of air pollutants and greenhouse gases are pretty much the same. Uh, air pollution is one of the most significant contributors to climate change. And unless we clean up the air, we'll never resolve climate change. Next slide, please. Black carbon or soot or PM2, a component of PM2.5 has a substantial climate warming impact. Black carbon has a short lifetime in the atmosphere, which primary contributor to ground level ozone pollution is the second most significant contributor to climate change. There are over 2.1 million uncapped abandoned wells in the US, which emit as much greenhouse gas as 2.4 million vehicles. And the rate of abandoned wells will likely accelerate as the economy converts to renewables. Monitoring emissions could identify methane sources and pr prioritize them uh, for capping and cannot I'd like to finish about solar. Uh, the DOE's solar future study forecasts uh, that solar could account for as much as 40% of the nation's electricity supply by 2035 and 45% by 2050. We could significantly increase solar panels output by reducing soot, soot and smart pollution. Next slide and open for any questions. All right, uh, Ian, um, I want to thank you for obviously a lot of that information and I put it out in the chat and forgive me folks for not saying, you know, the intent of these use cases are for you to ask questions. So if we want to open up some of that or for Jackie, if there's some specific person who wants some airtime to ask Ian a direct question, uh, more than happy to do that. Uh, we intend these discussions to be material for you, our audience, our pan um attendees to hear and then to go read about. Ian, uh, let me start with you. You obviously have this incredible company and you mentioned the U.S. government and the EPA. You know, here in the Beltway, a lot of uh, folks who sell into places talk about capabilities and their technology and their solutions. But uh, what's it been like? How involved are you in your company and sort of the policy coming out, whether it's EPA or Department of Energy, uh, informing your technology roadmap uh, at AirViz. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Uh, we're very early stage, so we actually, for the first time, have taken these devices and actually are, are, are putting them out um, in the in the fields for the first time. So we're making sure that we have our proof of concept network working before we actually go out uh, to the to the market. So again, we're we're an early stage um, company. Now, do you find that that uh, some of the drivers for that development of your technology are requirements emanating from the EPA, or if you can speak to not so much a deployment, but I, 
I'm just trying to help our audience understand that sometimes what you think you can build has already been built. And I think, you know, what is your pitch, if you will, uh, not snake oil pitch, obviously, but your, hey, if you're looking for a company that, you know, in addition to the, a lot of the metrics that you've identified and folks, you know, Ian and his team, those are examples of things that are mission driven facts. I like facts, tell story, sell. Ian told a story based on facts that I would bet resonate with people, you know, in some of the federal agencies that worry about things like air, not just the EPA. So Ian, what, what um, would you say to people who might want to know more about how you've developed your technology based on the facts and the mission need when it comes to air quality? Yeah, Pete, just styling back to what you were talking about before, our, our, whole, our whole concept came out of the GAO report uh, on air quality in 2021. And it's, it's a fantastic report. It's a two and a half year study that actually looks at the, that the way that we actually measure uh, air quality here in the States. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, that what, and that's what really driven us um, and, and what we're actually building here at Airbus. Great. And do you have a chance in Pittsburgh uh, with the company? Um, you know, have you been visited by? Do does the Beltway come to Pittsburgh and and connect with you on learning a bit more about that technology? So it's not always you proactively. Are there folks engaged? And again, this is an opportunity for some of the people you're talking with. Uh, it would be good to know because look. The Beltway's a bubble. It's a little bit of its own vacuum. You and I both know that sometimes it's the left and the right hand. If they just knew that there was a company like yours or the ones we'll celebrate can make all the difference in the world in saying, wow, you know, Airviz is already tackling what we didn't even think to tackle. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're constantly um, talking, talking um, to people with, with in, in the different agencies um, <clears throat> that we could help and find solutions as well as industries were being monitored um, by the EPA and, and other agencies for, for air quality, both indoors and outdoors. Uh, so again, we're, 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 we're in an early stage company uh, ro rolling, out these, rolling out these technologies um, and, and making sure that we have our proof of concepts uh, solid. So now I'm having a riff moment of just something you said. And so again, folks, I put Ian's profile out there and the company, the URL, go check it out. Well, obviously, I think, Ian, if it's okay or what you want to uh, develop for us and that being a, uh, a, a different version of what could be publicly shared on your PowerPoint, let us know. Let me ask you this question, Ian. Um, and this isn't scripted, folks. It's just Data collection, you're collecting tons of data. Can you speak to just at a level of how do you analyze it given the world where there's so much of it? We talk about the volume, velocity, variety, veracity without your secret sauce piece, right? I imagine you're using technologies, advanced analytics, AI, machine learning to make sense of data. How can you contextualize how hard that is or what you've uh, transformed in your own culture to, to get to that that data with value, that information needed to make Airviz a unique um, value prop or provide a value proposition that, you, that is unique, if that makes sense. No, that makes, that, I mean, that makes perfect sense. And that's, and, that, and you're right, that is the exact secret sauce of what it is. It's not now necessarily collecting data, it's actually what, what, what you do with the data. And we've spent years at Carnegie Mellon University and Carnegie Mellon University has been a great partner. And as you know, it's a great computer science school. Um, so we have, we have a lot of the resources um, within the university that we could tap into uh, that's been a, been a huge asset uh, to building our solutions. Well, Ian, look, um, I, I, we're going to, I mean, I have 10 other questions and, and I'd ask if you could stick around and maybe provide a few links to, you mentioned the GAO report, maybe there's a couple, a good opportunity to give our audience a quick, uh, uh, a little bit of an update, something to, as I like to say, read about. <clears throat> I want to thank you for this uh, use case. Uh, we will be, as I shared in our working group, uh, looking to have a deeper dive discussion with you in 2023 uh, and, and help celebrate the awesomeness of AirViz. But uh, any parting shot for the group before we uh, take a, a minute, minute or two break and bring on Brian? No, I, again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, hope, hopefully I've made the case of people thinking, 
of, of what the air that they breathe because it, it is the fundamental um, part of life and and people people forget about that uh, but but it, it but it but it really is you know the most important thing uh, to sustain life amen to that brother you know we both feel that way all right kindred spirit that you are ian thank you thank you and we appreciate you stick around if you can and use the chat to send some links out for people to consume more about you and your company okay will do pete thank you awesome buddy hey folks uh so that's kind of how these are going to go we've got two more and we're going to bring up uh my colleague brian shromsky here i think we're just going to roll jackie if that's cool i don't think we need a break if people need bio breaks obviously they can do that sort of thing. I'm, I'm just rocking and my, my brain is a sponge. So with that, we're going to move into my man, Brian Shromsky, who I know, and I'm sure a lot of people inside the Beltway know. He's uh, somebody I have met uh, a couple of times early in my post-government career uh, and was pretty much blown away by his storytelling, but also his passion for technology at the most fundamental level. Uh, uh, managing partner at Verizon, uh, 5G, Trusted Advisor, Kentucky Wildcat, the other Wildcats, as I say, being a Villanova grad, uh, where we won our first national championship back in the day and beat Georgetown. So uh, everybody knows that about me. I got to show my Villanova love. Uh, but you know, one of the things that I think about uh, with Brian um, at times, and just when I say I get to know this, this individual, uh, is his credibility and, and humility. Um, did you know uh, he's been nominated and approved by the Secretary of the Start United States Department of Transportation to serve on the ITS Program Advisory Committee and has for three terms. This guy's well-connected and tells great stories. Today, over the next 10, 12, 15 minutes, get your questions asked, write them in the chat. It's Brian's floor to talk about what Verizon's doing other than the, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Perspective, as well as being a telecommunications carrier. 5G, we heard throughout telecommunications and security is the enabler for the IOT. Whether it's a, you know, a carrier like Verizon, it starts at the most bedrock level of how does this stuff connect? So Brian, floor's yours, brother. Hey Pete, can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed, man, yes, indeed. Uh, all, all right, sorry about that. I'm, uh, I got a little cold here, so I'm gonna plow through it. Thanks again for the great introduction and it's always good to see you. Uh, we're on cloud nine uh, with my beloved Wildcats winning and beating Michigan in London this past weekend. So unfortunately, I couldn't be there. We were supposed to go, but uh, we had to reschedule. So apologize for the great background. I'm actually out here in Phoenix, Arizona. We're actually hosting a public safety 5G event tonight uh, in downtown Phoenix. So if anybody's in the Phoenix area that wants to come down, uh, shameless plug there. But we are highlighting some of the technology we're going to talk about here over the next couple of minutes. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, let me just explain, as Pete mentioned, I mean, as I heard some of the speakers, I was in and out uh, this morning and talk about all the wonderful things that IoT uh, continues to bring to the marketplace here. And what we're, what we're very excited about is enabling that, right? Verizon has been around a long time. We do some wonderful things as well as all the other carriers, right? And bringing this new technology to the forefront. But at the end of the day, there has to be a connection one way or the other. And when we look at our growth model and our projections out there, the, the vast majority of why we're building these networks as we go to 5G and we're already starting uh, the groundwork for 6G, it's not necessarily human beings, but it's more about the actual devices themselves, right? And how do we enable all of the different use cases that we will dream up today in the very new future and also the long-term future is these are the four uh, pillars that we're going to do this when we build out our radio access network, right? So stop to, uh, starting at the top, millimeter wave. Uh, this is our 5G ultra wideband, what runs on two frequencies, 28 and 39 gigahertz. We have a thousand megahertz uh, throughout the country in terms of depth. Uh, we've deployed this. Uh, we started in April of 2019. Um, so we're three plus years. We have roughly over. 30,000 millimeter wave sites throughout the country that is growing, um, which is very exciting for us. Actually, it was um, in Phoenix, I say, waiting for the restaurant and I did a speed test where it's millimeter wave. Arizona State University is right behind me. There's a huge dense uh, uh, 5G millimeter wave in downtown Phoenix. And to give you an idea of speed, I was getting like 1.9, 2.1 gigs down in a full urban environment, which was pretty impressive. 
Uh, we're not there yet. I would tell you on the uplink speed. So as we go into the end of 22, going into 23, as we migrate to what is called 5G standalone core, going from non-standalone, you'll see some enhancements on our network in 23 and 24, where we actually, traditionally, the demand has always been 80, 20 down, right? Meaning 80% of the traffic being pulled down. But in this social media world and the, the various devices that you can imagine, uh, the debate is actually going the opposite now, where it's actually now going from the end device up to the network itself. So we will see us change um, some of that uh, dynamic here uh, in the next year and a half, which is very exciting. The big band is also part of our 5G ultra wide band. Uh, this actually is our largest acquisition, second from the Vodafone uh, purchase when we bought out and became solely owned in terms of Verizon. But this is a big one. Um, this is a $65 billion project investment for Verizon. Uh, $45 billion goes to the FCC. $10 billion goes to the satellite providers to get off the spectrum. And an additional $10 billion in capital infrastructure. So what this will do is, similar to, you won't get all the high speeds that you'll see in millimeter wave, but some of the testing we've seen is getting up to a gig, um, which is very exciting on the C-band. What this will enable is giving 5G ultra wideband far and wide, right? So not just in urban, densely populated areas. And it doesn't have to be urban, right? But densely populated areas like Sioux Falls actually has 5G millimeter wave running. Um, but the idea for this is actually how do we serve more individuals and actually more IoT devices going farther and wider. Uh, low band, this will be a 4G or LT network. They run on multiple frequencies. Today we run predominantly on 700 megahertz. We run an AWS spectrum as well. Uh, we're very excited. In terms of IoT, right? Um, one of the things that people don't realize when it comes to IoT, most of these devices are supposed to have a lifespan of 10, 20, and 30 years. And in, in doing so, um, one of the, some of the first generation uh, IoT devices ran on our CDMA network, which we will be decommissioning here at the end of the, the month of December. We've pushed this out two or three years now. And the reason being is it's all IoT driven. It's not necessarily smartphones. People don't have really an old Motorola StarTex, but um, we're working with a lot of infrastructure folks. So if you think of pu public utility companies doing things like AMI or, or AMR, automatic meter reading, you know, how many times do they switch out that uh, meter in the side of your home, right, or the business? And that's what we're talking about here, um, which is exciting. So, but the challenge is how do we upgrade the, the networks, give more bandwidth, but at the same time, you know, uh, have a glide path for those legacy systems. So we've let this go on for like two, three years after we were supposed to decommission it. Um, and we extended another year just because of the supply chain crunch that a lot of IoT uh, manufacturers um, couldn't get the chips, right, with the supply chain, uh, chain crunch from the pandemic. So, um, you know, we gave enough time out there and the supply chain is now uh, back up to speed, if you will, and we'll be decommissioning this 3G network. And then you'll see satellite. Um, so not only just to talk about terrestrial networks and the cellular capabilities, uh, when Amazon launches their low orbital satellites, we'll actually do some partnership. We also have other satellite services, but we will start folding in satellite services into our IoT platform and portfolio enabling different devices. So if you go to the next slide here, please, um, this is a slide that I really like, right? And the reason why I like this slide and what you're seeing here you won't see a smartphone on this slide, right? So as Pete's mentioning, you know, IoT and what kind of devices here, we, you know, this is our foundation that enables all these different IoT devices. And what I mean by that is we have an, a narrowband IoT network that runs on our LTE network. We have an LTE CAT M1 network, um, which is designed for low power devices. We have a 4G LTE network, and then you'll see 5G um, as well. And what you're seeing here at the bottom of the screen um, what, what you're starting to see is, depending on the application, does it necessarily need 5G is very exciting, don't get me wrong, right? It's a big force of Verizon, but you will see that a lot of IoT use cases don't require all the capabilities of 5G, right? So I highlighted those in red on the bottom right, right? Where we see IoT or actual use cases that's going to require the high speed, the low latency. So things like, now you can do this on 4G, but connected drones, right? Um, this brings in edge compute because you want to keep the drones as um, increase the uptime or fly time, right? So you have to lessen the payload in terms of weight, right? So for cloud computing, high resolution video, right? If I can stream that, do the analytics back on, on the edge rather on the actual drone, 
this is very important. So virtual reality, autonomous vehicles, video surveillance, primary and secondary connectivity, which can be done on 4G, but all of those, just a sampling of the use cases are gonna require 5G. On the other side of the spectrum, if you're talking about tracking devices, you're talking about land mobile radio, which I consider IoT devices, the actual radio sites themselves. One of the big things we see in the federal government as well as state and local is the digital transformation and modernization of agencies, networks, and a lot of them that's still copper, still pots like, right? So we probably have, I would say the federal government today, I am doing things today from seismic monitoring to air quality, to radiation, to seismic activity, to tidal uh, stations, to precipitation measuring with NASA using high resolution videos, uh, with the USDA and their Snowtail project, where they're actually, you know, this is a great story by IoT. What they do in the Snowtail project is actually this time of year, um, they're monitoring the snow caps, right? And how much precipitation, how much snow we're going to get this winter. Why? Um, they're using cellular connectivity, UHF and VHF is expensive, satellites expensive. Um, we have a good network. They can do this. They actually have it solar. So you have infinite power, infinite uh, connectivity, which is great. But they actually take this data and actually use this to plot uh, and then relay that information to the U.S. Forest Services because then they can start predicting what most likely where it would be hot areas, where it would be dry areas based off all the work they're doing uh, today during the winter months preparing for the fire season, unfortunately. Um, it never seems to end in some cases, but um, later this summer or um, uh, late spring of this year. But also you'll see different things in here, wearables, pedestrian safety. Um, right here in Phoenix, I'll, I'll just see an example just where you can see this technology. Um, I was here about two, three months ago, and I see the Google Waymo um, self-driving vehicles. Now, two, three months ago, there were actually drivers behind here. Last night, we were walking to dinner. I saw three or four downtown. There are no drivers, right? Um, so you can see how rapidly this technology um, is changing. And then you think, see things like 5G enabling, you know, just not a simple meter or monitoring participation, but just to think about all the IoT sensors coming out of the vehicle, all the different cameras, right? So you can really see that spectrum from low bandwidth connectivity all the way up to uh, high power connectivity. And that's where it gets really exciting. And that's what Verizon brings to the table, right? In a lot of cases, we don't necessarily make the device, we don't make the application, but we are a key enabler. And this is why a lot of agencies as well as private businesses like this, right? So if you look at, um, I'll just give you a bunch of examples because I'm sitting here, but you go outside, and you'll trip over one of those scooters in the city. Now, Phoenix does it probably a little bit better where you just can't leave the scooters everywhere, um, like the Uber and the line scooters. They actually have designated areas. But the point is, firms like that, and they use, in some cases, Verizon, they actually have a SIM in there, so an IoT device, right? So I want to find the scooter. I want to connect with that particular device. I want to have an experience. For them, it's great, because then they can have one carrier and just deliver that device, right? So when you look at critical infrastructure, and we do a lot of work with um, Exelon, um, where you all live, BG&E, Pepco, Pico, uh, Dominion Power, right? So the bucket trucks are connected through our network, but also, as I mentioned before, the meters on your home, things like American Water, if you have city water and sewage, um, they actually put a magnet on the water pump that actually has a flywheel that has a cellular chip in there. Why? Because now they can get real-time information from the grid, right? So the days of calling in, uh, when you lose your power, you lose your water services, they already know before you're actually calling in because these things are constantly monitored because the chips have gotten so cheap and the connectivity has gotten so good um, that they just overlay their network, right? So on a mass scale, on the federal level, if you get a delivery from US, uh, US Postal Service, um, there's roughly around 300, roughly almost 300,000 scanners, IoT devices that are running on their network and they scan and that actually integrates um, we actually run what is called a mobile private network. So in essence, the Postal Service runs their network on top of our network. We're actually, um, those, all that information, think about, especially this time in the holiday season, how many different packages are being delivered, uploaded, and all that information actually runs off our network and goes into their two main data centers in San Mateo and Egan, uh, Minnesota. Um, but, you know, to give you an example, real time, and then it gets even exponential, we start talking about you know, how many homes, how many businesses are relying on power, that's where IoT really starts taking off. And then, as I mentioned before, you know, really getting into 5G, what are those applications that are going to require different things? Because, like I said, a lot of these MBIOT or CAD-M1 devices, 
Um, the battery life can last 10 years, right? If you're only reporting back once a day, once a month, once a quarter, right? But critical information, you've got thousands of sensors in the field. You couldn't drive there to download it. We do still, still see agencies, federal and SLED, that are manually going in there, putting in solid state drives, which are great for backup, but to get that data, um, it's like painting the bridge. Once you finish it, you just have to start all over again, right? So how do you ingest this technology? And then you'll see smart energy, right? We've got a lot of things going on now where we're actually using um, IoT and our network to actually monitor uh, solar grids. Um, one of the ones we're doing in the DOD in particular and partnership with the Miramar, the Marine Corps uh, Air Station down there, Miramar um, in Southern California, they're working with their integrator that actually has a grid where they're actually using our network to monitor the grid, right, in real time. And then you'll see things like body-worn cameras, right? Um, I, I think what we're starting to see now, um, it's not just a smartphone, it's not just a connected iPad. Now we're seeing, obviously, laptops having cellular, which they have for years, but now it's a smartwatch. Now it's also a body-worn camera. Um, now it's your ID, right? We have, in some cases, the actual ID card um, can take a cellular chip in there. It's a little bit thicker, but actually using that technology to monitor your ID. So when you look at a person now in a federal agency, he or she could have, oh my, um, anywhere from three to seven different devices connected to them at any given time, right? Um, which is just mind blowing. So that's why we're making this previous slide, making this huge investment into the networks as well as all the other carriers because the demand is only going to increase, right? And when you start doing video, video is, um, I told the story and Pete's heard this a million times, but we had one agency that had 30,000 smartphone devices, which is great, um, but two video cameras that were doing surveillance generated more data. So two modems over cellular generated more data than 30,000 smartphones, right? Um, that's where it gets really interesting in terms of 5G and really looking to do um, some really cool things, um, but video is the key, right? So as I mentioned, that autonomous vehicle uh, that I saw driving last night, um, there's about, a, I would say, at least a dozen cameras on there, right? Um, and that's what we see. It's not just the smartphone, but more importantly, all the information, billions of devices that you want connected. So, you know, as you drive home and you're, you know, you're back, hopefully it's warm uh, back home there in the, uh, <laughs> the D.C. metro area, but you know, give you an idea that you'll drive home today and if you go in the office, hopefully you're going back into the office, but, um, you know, you see digital billboards, um, digital signs on the side of the road, uh, the call boxes on the road, right? Those are all cellular enabled. Um, you know, you go to a Wawa, um, the, gas the, the, the gas pumps are actually cellular enabled in real time. You go in there and use the PNC, the ATM machine, that's cellular enabled, um, you name it. Um, it's happening. If you go in there and you get your wonderful Coke product, uh, that actual Coke freestyle machine with the whole digital display, if you will, there's actually a, an LT chip in there that's monitoring in real time that Coke machine, not relying on the Wawa or Harris Teeter or Wegmans, if you will. So really cool stuff. But the point I want to make here is you'll see any smartphones on the slide. Uh, but the idea is actually having Verizon where in some cases we'll offer end-to-end -end solutions, but a lot of cases we will work with the OEMs and the actual manufacturers. So the other thing too, on the flip side of IoT, and this was mentioned around the cybersecurity. If you're watching all your devices, watching all your people, I call it the micro below the, the watermark, if you will. And what I mean by that is a lot of these devices or solutions that an agency will build or will buy and consume, will have internet connectivity already provided and built in and not running over your network, right? So if you actually have an HVAC system, right, from one of the leading manufacturers, I will tell you, there is cellular connectivity in there. Why? It's part of the service contract. So it's not using your Wi-Fi network. So there is going to be um, other cellular components in there. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about an IoT. Um, this was told to me, but I, I think it's a really good story. The agency remained nameless, but it was a secure agency. And they got all excited because they had a... Um, uh, a self-cooking hot dog machine, right? And Fridays were the day and say, hey, we all go on the cafeteria and, you know, you, had a, you ordered a hot dog and it made it everything in there and everybody's excited. Like, oh, this is really cool. It's like almost like 3D printing for hot dogs for lunch. But one day, the white van shows up, security, you know, all the ears perk up and they're like, oh, can we help you? And uh, the individual says, here, I'm here to fix the hot dog machine. You're out of ketchup. 
And they're all looking at each other like, okay, um, how do you know that? He's like, it's connected. <laughs> and that set off a whole firestorm, right? But the point is, just keep in mind when we talk about these great services, um, you know, the ability is you're actually consuming a lot of this connectivity um, yourself. So if you go to the last slide, I think it is here, Pete, for me. Becky, whoever's controlling the slides. But here's just another example here, of putting it all together, those last two slides here. So when we look at enhancing the citizen experience and the agency options, so I mentioned some of the wall stuff that we will do would be like on-site, which we see a huge push right now in private 4G and 5G, 5G and MEC. You'll see some end-to-end -end solutions like our blue gene, but anything like digital signage, intelligent video, intelligent lighting, we're actually working with the leading manufacturers out there. So I think like the Philips of the world, the Medtronics of the world, if you're talking about a smart hospital environment, a virtual agent, um, like I said, you go to a lot of digital um, billboards, shopping malls, different things like that that interact over airports. We're actually using cellular connectivity as a primary means of transmission. Um, so you can actually put all these different things out there, um, which is really exciting um, if we go forward. And then on the last slide here, taking it from a, you know, from a DOD standpoint, um, very excited. We're actually building out our first private 5G uh, deployment with OSD out there in Pearl Harbor. Um, which is exciting, but here's a perfect example, right? When we look at, and like I said, Verizon is providing, you know, the, the base, you know, connectivity here, but these are all different use cases, right? Um, I already talked about asset tracking, right? So you can track anything you want to, it has a cellular component on there. Uh, we've got partners that are FAA certified, so you can actually track a pallet. You can actually put it into a USPS envelope, detects light, it will actually have the sensor, so you can actually ship something put it onto a cargo container, put it onto a, a C-130, fly across the, uh, across the country, but also across the ponds, and you can actually track it in real time using cellular and Wi-Fi connectivity, right? But VR and AR, AR and VR training is gonna be a real hot spot for 5G. If you ever done AR and VR, I have, um, I get motion sickness. You know, if you go left, you go right, it's not smooth, but this is where 5G and edge compute, and I've actually done some work um, we have an innovation lab in Boston where we have some federal agencies out there and you can actually see it. Um, and we had a 360 um, treadmill. So you actually not only had the experience from wearing the goggles, but actually walking. Um, in this case here was actually for an airman, he or she uh, fixing a um, landing gear of, an, uh, of a fighter jet, right? So actually put an ARVR and actually simulate walking up uh, to the aircraft so you can do an inspection and at the same time narrowing down and then actually taking a knee and start working on that landing gear and all in AR, VR, not having that motion sickness, but also actually physically walking, which is really cool. But all these different sensor technologies, Pete, you can imagine, right? So as I mentioned, body-worn cameras, um, we, we see in some cases they're actually weaving the sensor into uh, the BDUs, into the boots. Uh, automobiles are fascinating. Um, automobiles will probably have anywhere from 10 to 11 cellular connections with an automobile, not owned by you. Um, so we think about the tires, the rims, these are all different OEM manufacturers, right? Um, and then all the components in the vehicle itself. So really cool stuff. But when we really look at this, this is what Verizon brings to the table is having this network foundation that enables all these different use cases, either directly or indirectly, uh, which is very exciting for me. And I've been here 23 years, hope to do another 23 because it changes every three years. Um, which keeps me young um, <laughs> as best as I can be. So, Pete, I'm, I'm going to leave it there to answer any questions you may have or anybody else from the sure. group. But thanks again for the opportunity. 100%, man. Uh, and I hope you can hear me now. And Jackie, uh, if you want to take down the prezo, I'm going to just have a couple uh, questions for Brian. Brian, you know, you taught that last slide kind of me tells it all. That's the anatomy. And there's obviously, in the case of Verizon here, again, a company that's not just a cell phone company or a service provider to your iPhone or whatever phone you use, a Google phone, I always worry about companies I say get slapped around for, why'd you say Apple stuff and not our Google stuff? Uh, anyway, it's the, un it's the fundamental, it's the design, it's the architecture, whether it's private LTE or leveraging AR, VR, augmented reality folks, virtual reality, two different things, a private LTE network, we're talking about real-time communications. I love the right sizing, IOT business solutions, not just for commercial, but for government. So Brian, let me just put it out there. We got a government audience. We got, you know, at state, local uh, and federal. Uh, how are you getting a sense of, of, 
let's just say the federal market or the government markets embracing a lot of what you talked about, you know, be it sensor-based infrastructure, uh, 5G, what, what are some of the recognizing there's always challenges and people worry about not in my backyard, I'm not an early adopter. What, what are you getting a sense? Is, is the government kind of moving in that, hey, the train left the station on 5G and, and IoT? Uh, I think the government's doing a pretty good job. I, I think, um, I know the Department of Transportation a couple of years ago was one of the first agencies to add the role data administration officer, right? And to unlock these reams of data. And a lot of federal agencies have followed suit, right? And what, I, what I've said, and I'll use an example, right? So with the U.S. Geological Survey, right? We have roughly a couple hundred sensors in Northern California, right? Now that well has been there, right? You know, where they're monitoring the well, where they're monitoring the fault. But what's really changed is, you know, the UHF, VHF actually using a land mobile radio network or satellite just became too pervasive in terms of expense and maintenance. But the mission still continues, right? So that's where you ingest cellular to actually see, you know, hey, I'm, I'm still doing the same thing. But we see an enabler that can bridge the technology divide in terms of going from analog to digital keeping the price point amount the same, if not lower, right? Because you're actually paying for the data. It doesn't require a lot of data. But more importantly, Pete, it gives you, able, you know, the ability now and saying, hey, I could add more sensors, right? I'm not bound by, you know, now we're starting to see sensors on top of sensors. That's probably the biggest thing I'm seeing federal, right? Where I have some monitoring station, right? You know, seismic, like I said, a tidal, whatever it is. Uh, one of the big things the Coast Guard has an issue, people stealing the batteries from the buoys. That's a big issue. Um, I mean, if you saw here, in, in, you know, it's not related, but you can see what the havoc would be. You saw it in the Suez Canal when one, you know, one freighter stuck and you saw it in the Chesapeake uh, this past summer. But the point is, now I can actually have sensors on sensors. And what I mean by that is I could have a seismic monitoring station and then I can have a surveillance camera monitoring that, right? So I couldn't do that before, right? So you're starting to... I would say like Lego blocks. And I'll, I'll tell you a real world example. We see this in body worn camera and this would go into federal policing, uh, which we see body worn cameras taking uptake as one state local, right? Whereas a suspect is being chased by a police officer. Uh, the suspect goes off the side of the road and runs into the brush, right? Officer on the scene runs after. There's no street signs, where are you, right? Second officer find, goes up on the scene, guess what? I know where you are because your body worn camera is giving me off the cellular networks, giving me information. So what I do is I actually then go into the trunk and launch a drone. The drone then goes, finds you and starts doing surveillance. Now that's cellular enabled, right? Now the officer can see now on their smartphone where the individual is going. They call the third officer, he or she shows up and says, put the canine unit over there because that's where the individual is going to be. They launch the dog. The dog has a body worn camera and also GPS. So now, like I said, now, traditionally, there's always been a cellular connectivity in that mobile data terminal in that vehicle, but that example now has just been amplified, right? Because the technology is there. So that's where I think it's exciting. And the federal agencies are doing this today where they're enabling this either directly. And I think a lot of research and engineering is actually going through grants through universities and that's how they're enabling it, which is really cool. So Brian, uh, well, there was a question that came in. Maybe you can do a quick response to that now and then after. But uh, I love the question from William Adams about assets and RFID. And I want to just quote something from the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers that does a great report card every year on America's infrastructure. And literally on page two, it talks about funding and systems of systems and connectivity. And again, the world's changing in front of us. Uh, but it says, Maintenance backlogs continue to be an issue, but asset management helps prioritize limited funding. Drinking water sector, for example, has embraced asset management and new technology to pinpoint leaks and target repairs. Doesn't say IoT there, but that's the real-time information that one, again, folks, it's not about putting people out of business and jobs. It's about using technology for that 24-7 access to information that the human brain, most powerful supercomputer, if you will, in the world, that we haven't fully understood yet to make decisions. And, and this is how technology and, and workforce development go hand in hand. So uh, Brian, look, we're at time. Do you have a parting shot in 30 seconds or less you wanna leave with the audience? 
No, Pete, thanks again for the opportunity. And just to ask real quick, I'll ask uh, William's uh, question real quick. Yes, there are asset taxes that will be cellular slash RFD slash Wi-Fi as well that you can track the whole thing. Um, we did some work with Boeing that actually outsources a Dreamliner wings that puts on to a outsourced um, train company, if you will, so they can track everything. And I think they lost like 30 wings. They didn't lose them, but it got decoupled, right? So they're able to do that in real time. But okay. Pete, thanks again for the opportunity. And uh, hopefully uh, we prevail in March over you, uh, but we'll see. Uh, well, <laughs> hey, hey, Jay Wright leaving has been a tough, <laughs> tough moment, but I'm all about Kyle Neptune and my, my beloved Wildcats. Brian, thank you, folks. I put some information on Brian in there. Get to know him if you don't already. Wealth of knowledge, obviously super passionate. Okay. Uh, to Jackie, we're, 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 on, we're on time and on schedule. And I see my, my dear friend, Mr. Uh, our, our Jim St. Pierre, wonderful Jim St. Pierre is going to be coming up after Jerry Kurtz uh, and, and looking forward to that. So stick around. Jerry, great to see you. I had a chance in my walkabouts in the last month to meet this, this awesome dude who has 20 years of experience. If you read about him, Google him, I'll send out his link. But He's all about IoT and in the world of Beltway, SaaS and PaaS, software as a service, platform as a service, sensor services, DevOps, DevSecOps. I didn't realize when I was talking to him that we were going to somehow migrate into the world of IoT and software development and the criticality of the complete software life cycle. And hearing it from a gentleman who's not in the Beltway, but has this entrepreneurial spirit uh, is a treat, uh, especially when it comes to looking at emerging markets. So Jerry, the floor is yours, fired up to have you and uh, look forward to your, your conversation, our conversation. Sounds great. Thanks, Pete. So uh, I'm going to take it from a different perspective. As Pete said, you know, I met Pete uh, to talk about JFrog, which is uh, the company I work for, which concentrates on DevSecOps. But in continuity of DevSecOps, we ended up in IoT, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, but I have IoT experience from previous multiple different companies. I started out in IoT back in around 2008, where I was part of a company that uh, essentially took software to interconnect a bunch of devices to roll out uh, the connected home and demand response solutions and consumer electronic solutions uh, to market. We launched with Verizon, one of our uh, the members here, uh, a connected home solution back then. We launched a demand response solution with uh, one of the metering companies, a company called Centric Meters. In fact, they also did a uh, not only electric meters for demand response, but water meters and all kinds of things. So connecting lots of different devices. Uh, where I am now, uh, JFrog, as I said, we're in DevSecOps, and DevSecOps is an exciting word for everybody now, uh, but it generally is not seen directly with IoT. And I'll talk more of how we got here, but let me talk a little bit about JFrog to give you sort of the background here. So let's go to the next slide. So JFrog, we're considered to be out there the binary people. So we came out to manage the binary. So when you produce code, uh, you compile it into binaries. Those binaries go on all these different devices, whether it be an IoT or other device. And in doing that, you know, we control those binaries for large amount of different customers out there, small, large customers, government, non-government. Uh, you know, we have closing in on around 10,000 customers uh, worldwide, you know, using us to measure, to use their binaries in a more effective way. And that's become more and more important as more code has been purchased from others, open source code, there's been all these security issues, right? We talked a little bit earlier about the security issues in IoT. Well, the security issues that come from the software and some of the hardware too, uh, but how do you deal with that? And we have a full life cycle of software to take you from the start of the code all the way to pushing the actual code to these devices in IoT. And that's where we have come into the IoT world. And I'll uh, give more examples of it. But we were originally managing all these binaries, managing all these security issues. And then the companies who use the software, which are not necessarily software companies. In fact, a lot of our companies are all different things, right? We sell to uh, you know, stores. We sell to fast food places. We sell to almost anybody because the world is becoming software revolving, right? 
One of our customers, and I'll give you this as an example, it's not part of what I was planning, but it just came to mind. Uh, one of our customers in the fast food industry, right? They were using us to manage all their software and they do software for managing their inventory, their shipments, for managing their stores, for actually putting up the information on what people can buy, right? All these things are software related and they were managing the software and they asked us, well, we want to push that into the stores and onto the devices. And this was our beginning phases of moving into the Internet of Things, right? Because they wanted to streamline that because when there's a problem or when there's an update, they want it all to work together. And their software development was using this, their testing was using this, but why did they then have to you know, go through a whole process to download, upload, deal with all this stuff. And it was a lot of problems. And now we've come a long way from those days. And I'll talk more about that. Let's go to the next slide. So what we're doing is we're taking all these different technologies of software. We're optimizing them and standardizing it so that a company can do multiple different things because no company is just doing one because you at least have a website, you probably have a mobile app, and then you have whatever software you're using for your backend stuff. So it's all different languages and systems. We're unifying that all, we're securing that all, and then we're giving a way to push that all to wherever they're going. And they might be going to devices, they might be going to servers, they might be going to teams, customers, it doesn't matter. But we need a way to do this securely. We need a way to do this quickly. We need to do a way, let's do this Fast And by the way, when you push this there, as I'll talk more about later, you need to know who has what and why. And this is becoming more and more of a problem as you get more software out there, because when you get billions of IoT devices, how do you manage them? How do you deal with them? How do you increase your uh, competitive advantage by updating them? Let's go to the next slide. So what we're doing is we're taping DevSecOps to the connected devices. So the DevSecOps is the development and operation side of software development, right? Originally, everybody did development. They added in operations to do this a lot more efficiently. And to now we're pushing that all the way to wherever that software is going. And that's where we have a unique experience in, in this world of things because we understand the binaries. We understand the software. And as we move forward into taking that software to the devices, we can do things that others can't because of that aspect. And I'll talk more about that as we go through some of the examples and different things like that, because it's important to understand where all this software is coming from and where all these IoT devices are. Let's go to the next slide. So I like to bring this up uh, here because really for us, it's all about software updates and software changes and software understanding. Now, without that, understanding of the software side on the devices out there, you're not going to unlock the true potential of IoT. Because if you just have these sensors that are static, then you're not going to be able to continue to improve, to change things, especially with all the AI that's coming out here, all the machine learning, right? Everything that's going on, the software algorithms and what can be done changes very quickly. Right. And devices that used to be, you know, cars didn't change that much in technology over 10 years. Now they change a lot year to year. Right. And now they're changing in field with updates and different things like that. So the world is changing and the software is driving some of this change in the devices around the world. And so by connecting that software to the development cycle and to your control, you can change the way you do things and your solutions. And that's what we're doing for our customers, which I'll talk more about. Let's go to the next slide. So I like to talk about software updates because a lot of people think about software because they use software, but when you think about it in devices, so let's hit one, the animation one level. So when we take like an iPhone, right? Or we can take a Google Android phone, I don't care, right? Today, what happens when you want to update that device? If you're actually updating the software in the device, it downloads all the software. It then tells you you need to restart your device. You have to schedule that, or you have to push it to a good time. Then it restarts the device. It has to redo configuration. It's all a long process because what it's doing is it's taking the full software build and reinstalling this. Now, let's say there's a security issue on the device. It might just be one binary. 
that all you need to do is update that one binary for security purposes that could be kilobits. It has to do the whole thing to secure that device. Well, if you understand the binaries like we do, we can understand the difference between you build and we can change the way updates happen. We don't have to go through this whole process of making it cumbersome, right? And in this, you have to choose which apps you want to install, when, how, and all this stuff, right? If you think about this, this is quite antiquated. And we'll, we'll talk more about an example of a more fluid way of updating, but the way we're doing things, it's great. It's better than we had before, but it's not where we're going. And it's not what we're seeing in the first steps of streamlining this whole IoT side of things. Let's hit the next slide for automation. So I'd like to give another example, uh, Tesla. Uh, Tesla is known for their technology. It's known for their uh, curve of things. You know, if you look at the way they do it, this comes from their website, right? During the update process, you will not be able to drive your car, right? This takes several hours, right? You have to schedule it. Again, it doesn't do it in a way that makes it easy for the user and that makes it seamless. Hit one more animation. So let's talk about websites. Uh, websites are great, but they work a whole different way. When you go to a website, you know, you go to, I don't know, Twitter or, or Facebook or whatever, you don't know what version you're using. You don't care, right? It's giving you functionality, right? They control it all. And part of the reason they control this all is because they control the servers, which then push the things to the different devices. They can even run certain pieces beforehand, right? We're gonna send a test of a new version to a thousand people from this geographic area because they can control every little piece of the environment. This is not what's going on in the world of IoT today, right? We don't have that controllability. We don't have that flexibility. They know when a server goes down because they're told and they can quickly respond to it. Right, This information two-way street on what's going on changes the way websites work versus these devices. What we expect to see and what we're enabling people to start doing is to make the devices much like the website, right? where you have all that flexibility to control things, to understand things, to know who's doing what and why and where. And that becomes so much more of a advantage to your competitors. Let's go to the next slide. So I'm gonna start out with uh, a, a, a government use case. I wanna be clear, we don't have a lot of government IoT examples. We are just getting into it. This is one we recently closed, uh, which I'll talk about, but we're getting more and more interest and more and more things going on. We come from the commercial side. We have a lot of customers in government using our life cycle for software, right? So uh, we're in the government, but the IoT side, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't want to speak intelligently about how far you guys are into things, what you're doing, uh, but we'd love to engage you even more and help you do it faster. But this is one uh, which is a real life example. So there's a top defense electronic company out there who was supplying a system for updating things like combat vehicles, like tanks and different things like this. Um, and they had their own software updating solution, which they were running into multiple different challenges with, right? They found out about our solution and we started talking and, uh, you know, we've even had to make changes to our solution because we're learning a lot about what they needed, which is a little bit different than what the commercial side needs. Uh, but we're in the process. We won a 30 year contract with a with them, with a European uh, army. Uh, to basically deploy a communication system, which they supply with our software on it, so that we can update all the different software within the combat vehicles, and we can continuously not only update them, monitor them, understand them, change them, and give information back to that army. So it becomes even more intelligence than ever before, because they, before this, they were, you know, essentially having to take you know, USBs of software to them and do different things. Uh, and it's using their own network, right? A proprietary network for all this communication and their own security that we're working with them on all these different things to make sure everything happens in the right way. So it's all about securing, controlling and monitoring all these updates. Let's go to the next slide. So where their challenges came from were 
they needed a secure software to supply chain. And they needed that and a lot of the IoT pieces uh, from their side we're coming from being fully on you know, a SaaS solution online, which we have, but we also have on-prem solutions and we have mixtures of those solutions and private SaaS solutions and all kinds of different things like that. So we were able to enable them to actually have different pieces of the solution run totally different than anywhere else and for them to control a bunch of these pieces in totally protected environments. Two, they needed visibility. Right. They wanted to understand all the information on these combat vehicles in real time, understand what's going on, collect that information, do things with that, give them the ability to analyze and update based upon this. Three, they needed flexibility and scalability. And you know, I think everybody understands this, but you know, they needed something that could scale to large scale. And you know, we've done things, you know, we started out in the software world, as I said. We've, we distribute software, we've distributed billions of binaries per month to different customers and different things like that, right? This is at scale and we've taken some of the server side into the IoT side, as I said, where the server side does things much more intelligently. And three, they need an app, AirGap install, right? Uh, we supply AirGap of all of our software solutions, but this is the first time uh, we've been working directly with them on the IoT side of the AirGap, which has its own interesting uh, challenges and different things like that, but we're working on that right now uh, with that. Let's go to the next slide. So the reason they went with a solution like ours, and as I said, they were using something else that just didn't work very well, was they wanted to add that value. These devices are in the field, you know, in this case, 30 years, right? But they're, in the case, they're, they're a long time. They're becoming more and more software, based, which means there's more and more ability to improve them and to continue to drive different capabilities. Two, they wanted to reduce security risks. Uh, as I said earlier, with different software things in there, if there is a security problem, and we have all this software to do the scanning of your binaries to understand security risks, and uh, other companies have that too, but when you find one, how do you deal with it, right? How do you know, okay, we have this security risk, this build has it, which of my devices have that built? How am I gonna roll out that change? How can I do that efficiently? How can I do that in a way where I roll it out to a first one? And by the way, I can see, did it succeed? Without anybody, and a lot of this comes from sort of the web type mentality, right? When a server rolls out, they roll it out. You know, we, one of our big customers is like, you know, HBO, which they use all the software within our system to roll out new streaming sites when they launch new programs and they have to do it in such a way on the web, on the uh, servers to do it really quickly and efficiently. Well, the same thing can be said and done in the field. And that's what we're working towards. And then three, increased control and monitoring, right? Everything needed to be controlled, monitored, right? It can be very dangerous if there's any risk of any of these devices being taken over or you know put someone else's software in it. So uh, a lot of these things are you know, very important to the, our government customer. Let's move to the next slide. So I'm gonna talk about a few, well, a, a few commercial areas of IoT, just to give you an idea of some of the areas we fit. And, and the one thing about this whole IoT is there's so many different technologies, so many different ways you can use it. And so these are just some examples, not to say, like I said, the earlier, the fast food side of things, it's just another example. But we have a top US car producer uh, who wanted to tr continually drive their innovation in software. And if we go to the next slide here, they wanted to drive it not only in their development, but which by the way, we've been working in the, in the factory side of the automotive side for a while now, right? To update all those machines, the building, et cetera, to optimize different things but they want to now move that into the customer relationship, right? As I said, we spoke about, you know, companies like Tesla, more and more interfaces, interconnect, the way you deal with the customer and the way you think about it is through the software side. Two, they wanted to continue to drive value, right? As opposed to you buy a car and it just sits there with whatever it came in. And it's pretty typical, you know, I, I, at one time I worked for Panasonic where we sold, you know, stereo systems in cars essentially. And, you know, they were always old because 
you know, they were afraid to put it out and have to have a recall. Well, now when, you know, Tesla has a recall, they can over the air update and they can do it in a much more efficient way. So it's changing the way these things all work and how customers view the car companies. And then three, as I said, we've been in manufacturing a while and I'll talk more about this. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, as I said, we started out in managing software and for most of our customers, we continue to do that because it becomes very important to properly manage and secure your software throughout the life cycle. And if we hit the next animation, but then you need to deploy, control, update those devices and set the next animation. Whether it be in the connected manufacturing, as I've said, we've already played a key role in, in multiple different automotive companies, or we hit one more animation, manage and monitor these devices, and one more, sorry. And then the connected automobile. And the idea here is as they want to understand and change the devices, they can send updates to the cars. They can also get details back from the manufacturing facilities and from the cars on how people are using them, how the software is running, right? For in fact, our software can understand diagnostically, they keep crashing, right? And rather than before you get customer complaints, the system feeds back of the problem back to the company where they can fix the problem before the company, the customer even knows there was a problem. Right. And, and the way these things work is totally changing. And again, think of it as the way the web works. Right. You don't know when this, that or the other happens. Right. Here, updating of the car can occur when the customer is not using it. The cost, if we, we use traditional web based methodologies, right, when we put down a server to upgrade someone else's server, we also supply SaaS from a large number of customers out there. We don't turn off the service, right? We have redundancy. We have a way to switch from one server to the other and do that. Well, that can be done the same way in IoT devices, and it's starting to happen. Let's move to the next slide. So I spoke a little bit of manufacturing, but we have manufacturing customers using sensors, using cameras for analytics and pushing updates to them, especially with AI and ML and the camera side. It's become very important because as you learn what's going on, you change what you collect, how you collect it, what to do, and you can do it much more streamlined through all these facilities and improve your efficiency in the factories, what a lot of them are working on and doing to a really large degree. Let's move to the next slide. And then device understanding and remote maintenance, right? So we have a company who does connected appliances, who basically optimizes the energy for their customers and brings down large amounts of energy for these large customers because they can pull all the data and they can control all these things. And by the way, one of the things that they started doing, which we didn't even envision initially, was because they have all this software here, they can now debug, solve issues without sending out technicians to the field, right? And do it all with our software capability and send the update, test it. And then when someone else gets it, push that really fast. So it changes the way people are working in different types of environments because you no longer have the problems you have of remoteness, right, with this type of connectivity. Let's go to the next slide. So, uh, you know, this plays into what we offer for the IoT side. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, I know I'm running low on time, so I want to definitely leave time for any questions. But we have a tool called JFrog Connect. Uh, that is connects to all of our other DevSecOps tools, uh, which we've spent a lot of investment in, which allows you to control the updates, troubleshoot things, monitor what's going on, securely do that, know what device is using what software. So as I said, if there's a problem, you know, okay, here's all the other people who are going to have the same problem. Here's how I deal with it. If there's a security risk, I can change that security risk on all those devices in a methodical way, however I want. And all this can be done by the user with control and automation and simplicity. So I wanted to leave you with that. I think it's a very different take than some of the other guys, but uh, I'm open for any discussion or questions if you have any. Yeah, Jerry, thank you. We don't have a lot of time. We're going to bring in Jim St. Pierre, but I really appreciate the comprehensiveness of that. And again, folks, if you're asking questions, I'm going to take a few minutes, maybe two or three, and Jim St. Pierre, if we can just... Uh, Give, give Jerry and I have one uh, a minute or so to chat. I, I took away Jerry, obviously, 
knowing you a little bit, but that presentation really personifies or, or, or contextualize or illustrates for everybody in this town in the Beltway, again, that is, you know, the buzzword of DevOps, DevSecOps. There's a reason that when developing software now for the Internet of Things, uh, that connection exists. And, you know, I appreciated hearing that when we were talking about tool chains and the like, and it is a big part of government. But, um, you know, what what can you say today you heard from this, you know, Beltway perspective that, 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 that excites you and, and frankly, you know, maybe leave some encouraging words of, hey, we've done that. We are actually doing what the government's asking industry to do. So, I mean, I think I've been impressed by how far along you guys are. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, from what I've seen in the industry, yeah, a lot has happened. Now, to be clear, even in the commercial side, it's not everybody is doing the same thing. Everybody is doing their own thing. Everybody is creating their own world and we're creating that future today. And I think, you know, while you're, you know, again, I don't know how long everybody's been working on these things, but, you know, we've learned a lot along the way. And hopefully we can share that on the government side. And you probably have learned a lot too. I don't know a lot about what everybody's doing inside of it, but I can tell you the security side, right? There was some early discussions on security, on different pieces there. These are things we've been dealing with and continue to implement and improve. And, it, and as you guys said, it's not something that ever stops, right? It's not something that you can ever drop down upon. You need to keep improving and changing. And two, I think the importance of thinking of it holistically rather than just, here's my point solution that's going to give me the value. Think about how it interacts with your whole system so that you can do it in a scalable way, because that's one of the reasons we get called in more and more is someone, they try and deploy it when they have 10, 20 devices. Oh, it's pretty easy. When you have hundreds, thousands, you know, millions, billions, the level just changes and the importance of what happens. And as someone said earlier, when you have these large scale things, that's when you got to be more secure because they're not trying to hit the small guys. They're trying to take out the larger scale things because there's more to gain for them. Well, Jerry, look, a uh, couple things for the audience that I, again, you know, resonates with me. You started with binaries, and that's a term that people throw around here. And people are like, what the heck, binary? What, what, what bits, bytes, one, zeros? Even at that point, I love the connection. And again, for me and what I do for a living is celebrating technologies, again, that, that might have been born outside of, of the Beltway or in Silicon Valley or wherever. Uh, unknowingly, you're, you're actually going or maybe are where the puck is heading. And we appreciate that leadership. We hope to celebrate you more in our working group. We hope this was helpful to you. And, and again, folks, DevOps is cool. DevSecOps is cool. It ties to IoT, which makes it even cooler. And I want to just say thank you to Jerry and Jay Frog for, for taking this time as we get ready to close on out with uh, uh, our man, the, 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 as I say, wonderful, but cool as they come, the tall, cool one. If you ever met Jim St. Pierre, man, I wish I had his height. I would have been a decent quarterback, um, but he's got a brain and a vision. And let me just, uh, for the audience, you know, Jim, you're going to, if you, if you got a chance to hear some of today, this isn't a space that you're not uh, unfamiliar with. You know, we've had an incredible day of stories from industry, small, large businesses. Uh, we had a great panel with two of your colleagues, doctors, uh, Michael Dunaway and Barbara Cuthill. And, and we've talked about IoT and its impact uh, across smart anything, you know, grid, car, uh, street lights, uh, you know, air, what have you. Uh, folks, Jim St. Pierre is the deputy director for the NIST, um, specifically the Information Technology Laboratory, which Oh, by the way, is one of six research laboratories within the National Institute of Standards and Technology, annual budget of 120 million. I'm going off what at least I found on the site, 367 employees and 160 guest researchers from industry, universities, and foreign laboratories. Talk about collaboration and convening people. What a role. Uh, read his bio. Uh, Jim is crazy smart. Uh, but I love these little factoids. Before joining NIST in 94, hint, hint, has been there for a bit. Uh, he worked as a technical project leader with Loral Space Systems Semiconductor Design Group. If you haven't been watching the news, semiconductors are in the news or some big announcement. Forget the CHIPS Act for a minute. We might be uh, building those here uh, inside the U.S. 
uh, out in uh, Arizona. What, what an amazing development there. Uh, but he helped build and develop software and hardware at IBM for Los Angeles class submarines. And he, of course, has worked with several universities on semiconductor design curricula. So he's a teacher, he's an educator, he's a storyteller, and he's as cool as they come. So Jim, uh, floor is yours, brother. How, how can right. you kind of encapsulate today? Yeah, thank you, Pete. Uh, I did get to sit in on some of this, which is really great to hear. Uh, great discussion. Um, I love to hear the emphasis on public-private partnerships, because as you know, NIST is all about that. That's in our DNA. Privacy, cybersecurity, the economic benefits of, of, of uh, IoT. I, I do want to say thank you, Pete, for all you do. You are a very positive force of nature. Anybody that knows you, uh, you know, really appreciates all that you do. And that's a big part of what NIST is building this community. NIST is, is really focused on that as, as a, you know, federal workers, we take that oath to, to uh, you know, support the, the NIST mission and the federal government and making society better. Uh, we take that very seriously. We have a unique mission, in fact, of supporting U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness, the only agency that has that mission. We do it through standards, technology, uh, and, and trying to enhance economic security uh, to improve quality of life. And IoT is a key part of that, right? We see tremendous benefits from IoT. Um, and, and of course, you hear all the challenges. We, deal, we do a lot of work on cybersecurity because we know that we have to overcome the challenges of cybersecurity in order to be able to reap the benefits. Uh, but from the Commerce Department, which is where we're part of, there's all kinds of, of uh, opportunities to facilitate a strong economy to create jobs including new business models, right? You've probably, I think many have probably heard about the using IoT sensors enabled uh, uh, jet engine companies to, to basically rent jet engines to some commercial aircraft providers, and then they can monitor them and maintain them. And then they have a vested interest, you know, as opposed to selling something to someone and saying, well, the sooner that breaks, the sooner they got to buy a new one. Great. You know, well, it's a little different when you're renting and now I still own that. I just sold that engine to you. So all kinds of exciting new business models. I think we're still just seeing the tip of this. I think IoT is just getting off, you know, getting off the, 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 the starting blocks. And the federal agencies are using it. Many federal agencies are using it. But again, I think there's a lot more to come to help them uh, better achieve their missions. So um, I, I'll say trust is a key word that I've heard some here today. And that is one that is really key to us. In my laboratory, like you said, Pete, we're one of, uh, one of uh, six laboratories here at NIST. In the Information Technology Laboratory, we took some time and defined our purpose. Our purpose is to cultivate trust in information technology and metrology. And that's not the weather, uh, uh, <laughs> meteorology, that's metrology, because NIST is all about measurement. I think you heard Barbara Cuthill talk about that and others and Mike Dunaway. Um, so, but it, it's important to recognize also that you know, for trust, there's, there's risk. People have to take risks, right? And accept a certain amount of risk. And that varies from person to person, organization to organization. So we've tried to develop guidance on that, on, on risk management and how do you think about that? And that's really been our role is to develop those kind of documents. And it's been a challenge and a thrill to work with the community with, with Pete, uh, who's on the advisory board. Uh, we're very thankful for his time on the, the IoT advisory board. Um, you know, there's been some discussion of privacy today. I think that's an ongoing challenge. We have a privacy engineering program at, at NIST that's developing guidance to help people build privacy enhancing systems. Cybersecurity and privacy, they overlap, the Venn diagrams overlap, but just encrypting your data is not privacy, right? It's got to, for privacy, you have to think about how am I using this data that all these IoT sensors are, are giving me? Am I, should I be doing that? Should I be combining it with this data? What does that do? Is there potential harms for individuals? What are, obviously, there's a lot of benefits, but you also have to keep in mind where there are potential uh, pitfalls. And cybersecurity is critical to trust. And I think the JFrog talk was, that we just heard was really uh, excellent. Uh, it's talking about, from our perspective, we look at it broadly, right? We're not technology. We don't, we don't advocate any particular technologies. We're outcome-based, but we've developed a secure software development framework to help guide people on how they, how they can develop uh, uh, secure software. Uh, and there's certainly big challenges there, as people know that are involved in cybersecurity, that there's been recent hacks on the actual patching process. We have updated guidance. It was updated in 2022 on the, how to run an enterprise patch uh, program that I think people would find useful. 
We've also done things in the area of lightweight encryption, not meaning it's easy to break, but rather that it requires less resources, which is critical for IoT. You want to encrypt the data coming off your sensors in many cases. And so you need a, a, something that can run on maybe a smaller device that might be a small sensor you deploy in the field. It doesn't have the CPU and the memory that your, even your laptop has. Um, this gets also to AI. And, and then I'll, I'll wrap up here, Pete, um, but I know we're running out of time. No, no, but, rock and roll, buddy. Yeah, there's, there's so much data generated by IoT. And obviously artificial intelligence and machine learning is a critical tool that will help us make sense of all that data. And we were tasked by uh, legislation to develop an AI risk management framework. And so a big part of that is explainability and understanding and minimizing bias. So explainability just means, right, as most a lot of people know, a uh, machine learning, for example, is often constructed out of uh, neural networks or, or deep uh, uh, machine, deep, deep networks. And so these are, they are understanding how they come to the answers they come to is not easy. We're still working on that. And you need to know that because you want to know how did they, how did, why did we make this decision? Why did the software recommend this particular outcome or, or approach? And then bias, of course, is critical, right? Depending how you're using the sensor data uh, to avoid bias or, or very much understand the bias um, because these are socio-technical you know, systems. Um, and, and I wanna make, go back and make one other point about uh, their systems, right? These are complex systems that IoT are involved in. We can't think about just in, in securing the IoT device, right? It's part of a system. You've got to secure the network. You've got to secure the communications. You've got to secure the data storage if it's in the cloud or wherever it is. So um, we're working hard with all of you and the community to try to continue to provide new and updated advice and guidance documents um, and work with you on standards. Uh, and to, to advance these technologies. So I think my, my final, I wanna loop back to um, this federal, I know Barbara Cuthill talked about this too, but I think it's, it's important because it's part of this, what today's all about, which is sort of the networking the community. The, the, um, the advisory board, the NIST uh, stood up the, under, we were required to actually under the NDD, NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. And uh, within that required us to stand up both the, uh, advisory board in the federal working group. And I won't go through those in detail. Barbara talked about that earlier. But th the importance of those is they're gonna be looking at what can we do to advance IoT even more, right? And that's related to security, privacy, um, all the many different uh, aspects. Are there challenges? Are there things we can do? What can we do to help you know, improve that? So I would recommend that you uh, look, look at our um, IoT cybersecurity uh, webpage and the, and the webpage for the, the charter is out there for the advisory board. The advisory board, I expect that one of the things they'll be doing in the near, near future is a federal register notice to get input from the community, right? Because they want to hear. Pete and his other, uh, the other illustrious members of that advisory board want to be able to get as much input from the community to advise the federal working group that can then you know, affect uh, government actions on, uh, on how do we get this to the next level? How do we push IoT forward? So I just would just encourage everybody to give your input through that. We're listening. That's, that's part of who we are. Thanks, well, Pete. Uh, Jim, I mean, I was writing, and if you saw me looking, and folks who can tell when somebody's typing, I, I'm, I was putting out a lot of the links that you mentioned, the AI risk management framework, the secure software development framework. Uh, Jim, you know, you highlighted what, what wonderfully, uh, what, what Barbara did so wonderfully, and again, humbled to be a part of that. But folks, Jim used the word networking and community. That is what NIST does in addition to write incredible documentation. But love the emphasis on trust, Jim. Love the emphasis on privacy when considering IoT. This data explosion and making sense of it, clearly you have uh, so eloquently articulated and, and got, I hope everybody listening today understanding <laughs> it's not just IoT, it's cool. It's what are you collecting? Why? And how can you secure an addition to make sense of it? So awesome stuff. Any parting shot before I turn it back to the wonderful uh, Jackie French and team? Just, just again, I just want to encourage people that we want to hear from you. And, and Pete wants to hear from you on the advisory board going forward. So thank Amen. you. Thank Amen you for all that. Every, yep. Tall cool one that you are. Thank you, Jim St. Pierre, Jackie, in the spirit of finishing right at noon. Take it away. I had a blast. I learned a lot. I hope everyone else did. And uh, hopefully we can share this information in video and in, in text, however, and write about it. 
Thank you so much, Pete. And thank you everyone for your time today. We will be sending out a follow-up email with all of this information, including the links, the video, as well as the takeaways that have been posted online. Please share with your networks uh, via LinkedIn or Twitter. We will also be hosting another use case summit in January, covering blockchain on January 24th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. We appreciate everyone's time today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Act I Act event. Shout out to Jackie French, Connective Tissue. Thanks, everybody.